Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Oh, man. We already got it right. I just, I just got here. I'm eating my goddamn dinner. But I guess I'm here now. Holy shit. Ash, I love you. Thank you so much for the raid. Hope you enjoyed playing Terraria. Well, hello, gamers. You guys came on a great day, by the way. Uh, welcome in. My name is Jackie. I'm a giant cat. Um, today we're actually doing like, a little movie night. I'm watching Sekiro lore videos uh, for the whole stream, pretty much. So if you want to like learn about Sekiro's lore and uh, that kind of stuff, you know, get comfy. We're gonna watch some really cool videos from Vati Vidya and also uh, Azulia the Witch. But I just hit go live like two minutes ago. <laughs> so <coughs> I'm enjoying what some. What is a uh, man? A miserable pile of smee. Yep. This is the best part. Stop talking. This is the best part. Nice. I'm uh, enjoying some fried pork and rice, Jeez. and it's really good. Um, how Stubbs, he's good. But hi, everyone. Again, thank you so much for the raid. If y'all don't follow um, Ash already, you're missing out, because they are a extremely high-quality content creator, beautiful model, and just good vibes. Playing on plane to ride to be uh, being Hi-Fi Rush, but pieces being slow. Oh, I see. Well, I hope you enjoyed Hi-Fi Rush. That's a great game. Um, let me fix my lip sync. Give me a second. There we go. A chicken fettuccine al, al burro for dinner today. Wow, that sounds really good. And also welcome in Lily. I had to edit from pieces, so I gotta try and take her and fix stuff. Oh, well, good luck. Yeah, so we're gonna watch, um, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of Sekiro lore and some really cool, like, behind the scenes uh, videos and, like, things I missed. So, like, you know, a mixture of both in depth story videos and more, like, uh, just cool short ones from Zuli. Gotta sleep a little fall. Hey, thank you, Billy. Appreciate it. And also welcome in Jonathan and 22 and do what? Little Dracula, I know, little Dracula cat. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate you uh hit me with that right at the start of stream. I am oh! just trying to support Jackie and the body. Come on, Angela. <laughs> Thank you so much for the uh, 400 bitties and like with the one bit to save the day. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me just check a few things on my end. Alright. Oh, more jams! Yeah. I'm gonna mute so I can eat some food while it plays. Well, oh my gosh. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. The bits from Dissy and also the gift sub for Panda to Dan Sharkman. Thank you. Thank you, Sad Pandisard, for the gifted sub and the cake. And nom nom nom. Welcome in as well, Yellow Bolt. Hello. Cheese. Cheese. Let me get my uh, leap motion on. Are not the guy. <laughs> There's You're I not, train. Will be the guy. I had a guy, but now I don't. don't. You are not the guy. <laughs> you are not the guy. You know, okay, we'll be the guy. guy. I had a guy, but now I don't. You, you are not, not the guy. guy. Thank you for the bits as well, looking up my eye train at level 2. Thanks so much! Actually, you know what? I'll just keep my motion off for now, because... Yeah. Well, I guess since we got people rolling in, uh, we can talk about this week's schedule. 
for those who are curious about that. Imagine your thought about this. Are you not afraid of the potential spoilers, things you have not explored yet? Um, I, at this point, I kind of know what I've already missed, so I'm not too worried about it. You know, I got the, like, main story pretty much covered, so I I'm, I'm fine getting, like, other stuff spoiled hey, for now. Listen! Never hey, the uh, bits been Thank you. Who is Shack at? No idea. Some kind of suit, perhaps? Anyway, my schedule this week is very big, so I'm just gonna post the picture of my schedule, because it is large. Uh, let's see. Uh, ba -ba. Oh god, it's a big image. Mother, I am not so. <clears throat> Anyway. Oh, thank you for the tier one for three months, Toki. Wow. Go. Thank you, Toki no Akuma, for the resub. Sip, sip, mm -hmm. lem, lem, lem. Thank you. And here is a sweet schedule, for those who want to know. Uh, today we're doing Sekiro lore and possibly a new game plus, but it might just be a movie night. We'll see how I feel. Uh, tomorrow is the big Outer Wilds collab with Void Taffy on their stream. If we can get a shout out for Void, please. Um, this is where uh, Leg is going to be playing through Outer Wilds, and I'll be their co-pilot. We're going to both be debuting some new PNGs just for the stream. And then Wednesday back here, I'm playing uh, the rest of Echoes of the Eye DLC, hopefully beating it, but we'll see. Uh, Giga's Thursday, Breath of the Wild Friday, that's all the same. Saturday, I'm going to play Pizza Tower, which I didn't plan to stream that game or play it until I saw the first five minutes and heard the soundtrack. And I was sold. So, we're playing Pizza Tower on Saturday, and then some more House Flipper on Sunday. So, I'm streaming kind of all week, except for Tuesday. But it's a collab, so you know. A model swap? Uh, Pizza Pizza? Yeah, I'm so stoked to play Pizza Tower. It looks so much fun. Uh, yeah, you were doing Gremlin. This is Gremlin. <laughs> this is the Gremlin model. This this one is labeled Gremlin on the uh, model sheet. I'm already I already am the Grim. Pizza Pizza, yeah. Love House Tower, House Tower, and Pizza Flipper. Yeah, me too. I also love those games. The one, uh, I mean, just check the model list. It's right here. That's that they're labeled for to make it easier for me. So you gotta work with me on that, <laughs> so I know what to do. All right, let me make sure everything is good on over here. Hydrate, I will hydrate. Thank you. I have my drink right next to me. I uh, got a birthday event to go to. That's fair. But yeah, I'm really excited for tomorrow. I can't stop thinking about it. Like, first of all, I love Outer Wilds so much, but like getting to watch my bestest friend, who I love dearly, experience the game. I'm so excited. <laughs> it's like all I can think about is tomorrow's stream with Leg. Oh, it's just gonna be a blast. And I'll hype for today as well. Uh, to like actually like sit down and consume the lore of Sekiro with y'all. So you uh, love you too. I I was working on a PNG last night, but I'm gonna make a new one. I have a new idea. So uh... I'm gonna work on that after stream. Okay, let me swap to Scrungle or a uh, Spiral Cat model. A slice of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to see yours too. It already looks from the sketches really good. Okay. I think that we can uh, just get right into it. Ooh, I don't. Ooh. Since people are still like filing in from uh, you know, me starting stream and the uh, the raid. We'll probably start watching with some like Zuli videos because they're like more short and uh, not extremely lore based. They're just like cool, fun things about the game. So we'll do those first and we'll do the Vati videos later. Ah, my lip motion's not working. I can't show you my paws. It's not like responding to my, my hands for some reason. So I might turn off Show Me the Goods because I can't get my hands up <laughs> on this model. The beans? No, I didn't have beans. There's no, there was no space on the UV of this model to add beans. It's too small. Uh, okay. 
Let me turn. You what? You so fucking precious when you smile. Yes, just nubs. <laughs> okay. I kind of want to get going with this. Uh, I'm going to leave uh, Redeems on for now, but if they get too interruptive, I'll probably turn them off. So just be mindful of not too much spam so you can watch the videos and enjoy. Welcome in, Dom. Hello. So yeah, we'll, we'll start with uh, with Zuli videos because they're short and sweet and they're really, really cool. I can already tell. Uh, I've watched all of their Dark Souls. Well, some of their Dark Souls non-lore videos and their Bloodborne ones. Welcome in, Shadow Kitten. Hello. Gotta work on training stuff and watching how I draw chibis. Oh, nice. That sounds fun. Move chat over a little bit since y'all are gonna have more space to like breathe with today's setup. Um, if I'm muted and my mouth's moving, I'm eating my dinner still. <laughs> so there's that. Talking as well. I'm gonna be talking over it, but you know, I want to enjoy the videos. I think uh, I think they're gonna be fun to share with y'all and experience as well for the first time with me. So let's begin with this one. Oh, let me fix this crop. Hold on. This will be a bit cut off. That works. Anyway, I want to watch these. I, I think actually go back. I missed that while I was picking stuff. I want to see the development of all the games. Bloodborne 2015, Dark Souls 3, and then Sekiro 2019. That's a huge gap between the other releases. Oh, and the DLC. Oh, and Elden Ring. Yeah. I love it. Sucker was shaped by its diversions from them. That is true. Second two of the videos sponsored by the games publisher Activision looking at how Sucker differentiates itself from FromSoft games. Hmm. Ah, <gasps> my snake friend. I hope we can learn about the snake lore. <laughs> that snake was so cool. And welcome in, uh, like Yeager. Hello. Software games have a strong core identity with all build up from recurring themes and shared design elements. Oh. Dark Souls 3, my beloved. Band made familiar conventions with gay secular room to be better explore and broaden from Supper's Horizons. Artist Ryo Fujimaki remarked on the challenges posed by shifting from Western fans to Japanese designs. Oh, hell yeah. Welcome in, Likey. Hello. Ours have had less prior experience to rely on. Yeah, I really want to learn about like all the cool like callbacks to like Japanese like history and stuff in this game. Push artists to develop new skills, techniques, strengthen their perspective. Oh, I love it. Oh yeah, I forgot about the guy in like entire armor that we fought at that one point. That guy was interesting. Circa manifests as an imminent, imminent fall of the Ashina clan. How are they? I'm doing good today. I'm excited to just like, you know, relax and uh, just enjoy uh, some cool videos about Sekiro. Robert. Yeah, Robert. Although Ashina may fall, it's far from apocalyptic with the rich. I, I want to know who is Robert. That's what I want to know, you know? Like, I want to learn. Much the same with Dark Souls regarded as a modern take on Kingsfield, Sekiro's origins can be traced by Tenchu. Yep, I knew that much. Unlike Kingsfield, from software didn't create Tenchu. Instead, they acquired the license from Activision. I didn't know that part. To share a story between from software Activision, Tenchu is a part of why Activision was chosen as a publisher. I did not know that, like... Oh, that's neat. Tenchu Assur Shadow Assault Tenchu. 
I also love how Zuli uses like a lot of Zelda music in their videos. Makes me happy. Same time was unburdened by the restrictions that would come from being defined by those titles. I don't recall that statue there. Slotsaker's development would be more freestyle. In a hot bed of experimentation unconstrained by expectations. Ah. Let's carry forward Elder Ring with the overlap of the development leading to some Yeah, I wanna really like go back and play through Elder Ring after playing Sekiro. I think it'll be a, a fun experience. Its higher scope made it a perfect companion to the larger Elden Ring. On one side, Elden Ring was their most ambitious product so far, pushing the limits of the entire studio. My beloved Elden Ring. I love that game. On the other side, Sekiro was one of their most refined, making very calculated, efficient use of its specific focus. Another expansion, expansive map was a technical challenge on a scale beyond anything from software happened so far. It makes me really hype to see what they do next, after, like, Elden Ring being as large as it was. But the more lively, verdant scenery explored in Sekiro helped prepare the art team for a greater range in locales. Yeah, I guess that's good, too, is, like, the way Sekiro... Yeah, that makes sense. Like, how much movement base Elden Ring is with the horse and your own character. And yeah, I can definitely see that comparison. Sekiro is more direct and personal, and that goes this can be seen how Elden Ring handles much of its cast. As between the key characters of their, uh, their What is a he are, who? A miserable pile of smeef. Featured probably in more Sekiro Elden Ring. Welcome in, staplers. I haven't even explored Elden, Ring lore, Elden Ring's lore very much either, but I do want to go back and get the other endings uh, and see what those bring. As far as, like, knowledge goes. I got the bad ending of Elden Ring when I beat it. That was a cool video. Uh, and this one is called How Sekiro Sets Itself Apart. Draft Cat, yep. Prepare for a billion miserable pile of smeefs redeems for this chat cat. <laughs> it always happens. I love this, uh, like, ghost monk fight. This is that the first two videos sponsored by the games? Yeah, this is kind of like what we just watched, I think. It's like the same sort of video. We'll watch the next one. Previous videos were asked to show the night Oh, yeah, the night jar ninja, the Wu guy. Welcome to Rifcoms, hello. I remember the uh the Wu ninja. What you're seeing here is not a nightshard ninja that performs the attack. Oh boy. Hey coffee, welcome in. The kite has a nightshard model attached to it, which secretly hides as soon as you get into attack range. Oh, When I miss oh we just got started. Welcome in, Kochi. Hello. Muglin Blissy, hello. Yeah, I like all these kind of like technical videos that go into like all the NPCs and bosses. Oh, the Divine Dragon! I loved this fight, even though it was like a, you know, a gimmick fight. Still really, really cool. Turn the volume up a little bit for the tunes. Ooh, hold on. And this is like the dragon lore I really want to know. It, it was visually so cool. I don't even care if it's a like gimmick fight, you know? There's a group of boss with the player fight. Like most group bosses, the dragons have a respect representative of one NPC Used for the health bar, which takes damage for the whole group. Yeah, I knew that much. Is 
has 1,000 hit points, loses 40 whenever one of the white dragons dies. Does Chaka have a name? Yes, yeah, name's Chakat. <laughs> These large, which you can grapple onto. This is like definitely one of my in my top five like favorite bosses in the whole game. I think. You can perform aerial death blow. Yep, yep, yep. That was really cool as well. The aerial death blow is so uh so fun. Hi, stones. If the root spawns from below you, is that they're always following you. Ooh, that's cool. Total of 15 old dragons, which will continuously respawn until 25 white dragons have been killed. After 10 white dragons uh, have been killed, initiates a unique respawn mechanic spawning black- I, I noticed these- uh, the black dragons. You have less health and killing them doesn't lower the percent of health either. Yeah, I think this is Kakariko Village. Yeah, it is. They're not new NPCs. Instead, the respawn system edits the dragons as it respawns them. Oh, that's so neat. I love this. Their horns appear broken off, just when they are meant to be the white dragons you kill, but they are no longer they no longer cough. Has instead of just killing the old dragon, turning them as black dragons represents some sort of renewal. Welcome in Animorph, hello. If the white dragon accepts dragon rod, this may be ultimately beneficial to both them and the divine dragon. Oh, we already watched this one. <laughs> well, they have two Wu videos. Two of them. Came from clips seeing uh, Chaka. Hey, welcome. Great to have you. We're just uh, doing some video watching today. It's uh, been really nice so far. Very relaxing. Yeah, I'm open, Mad Cat. That was short. Oh. Spoilers for the final fight of Sekiro. <laughs> Mother bury the like deep within cast aside there's no coming home we're burning chaos in the wind. Okay. That's nice. <laughs> I've been dying to see how this boss fight works like uh fundamentally it's going to be very cool. So hot mortality taking his own strength, there's just the unification of Japan and keep Ashina separate. You. Yeah, so what I find really cool about like uh from soft boss fights is they're like animated like in like you can they like animate them and record them that way, which I think is really cool. So Zuli does this thing where they like, you know, adjust the camera so we can watch the boss fights happen without the like uh, cinematic view, and it, it's just so neat. I've been dying to see this bit. The Black Model Blade has power to open air gates to the underworld, allowing for a person's resurrection. Oh, that would explain how Ishin comes out. Commenced now that saving Ashina is beyond him, he sacrifices himself to revive the one person he believes could do it. Yeah. Ichiro puts hope in Ishin, his adopted grandfather. Oh, I hate it already. <laughs> Ishin appears to crawl out of the cut Ichiro made in his neck, and this game has to do a lot of create or a lot to create that illusion. Oh boy. It's already bizarre, and as well, a moment when just seeing normal with context only gets weirder in free cam. Also had a large portion of Ishin's body. <laughs> the floating foot. I love that. That's great. 
Wonderful. It's I I know I love this boss fight the uh, cinematic. Secondary to focus give it more opportunities to have impactful story cutscenes and they made some bold decisions. Welcome in, cool. That is awesome. I love seeing that kind of stuff. Like, ah, oh, that's that's wonderful. Oh, this is spoiler for me. I'm gonna skip this one. <laughs> Because I have not fought Owl 2 yet, so we're gonna just skip over this and watch something else. Why do the players remain mostly unchanged in Demon Souls? Uh, wait, no, I, I skipped it. That was too fast. Five feet, five inches for the player character. So has even common enemies has increased. You're tiny in Bloodborne. Very small. It seems really prevalent in Sekiro that you're just like itty bitty. Enemies larger FX camera suspicion while locked on also makes their animations easier to see. True. Player blocks part of the screen, so making enemies bigger than the player helps keep them from being covered. Oh, also, good point. Even though it's good for visual visibility, there are some potentially issues that come up. Small. <laughs> I'm so tiny. Usually it's not too distracting, the size of some human characters in Sekiro did noticeably stand out. I love it though. They're, like, all like freakishly tall. As is true in real life, having two actors with wildly different heights could make it difficult to frame scenes. Short! <laughs> Unlike real life, you could just get a different size version of the exact same actor in a video game. Small Ishin! Ishin and Ichiro Al and even the sculptor have special. Alternate models that are shorter, only using cutscenes. Oh, that's cool. I like that a lot. That's smart, though. Like, a smart way to work around, like, the, uh, like, cinematic shots in the game. So are presented some unusual challenges, and their solutions are interesting to see. Explain your smallness. It's for the gameplay. <laughs> I swear. Oh yeah, I wanted to put on a blanket for this stream to like get the coziness going. Let me grab my Wrecking Crew blanket. Oh no, I lost it. One little blanket to wear to get the coziness level up. Yeah, comfy. Perfect. This is a video about the, oh, the giant doll. Turn from the stray doll, wait a moment, and then uh, turn back and look at it. It can be seen moving. This is a cause some special about the doll's looking at when you can't see it. What's actually happening? I think I know what this is, actually. I've seen this in Bloodborne happen. Yep, I was right. <laughs> a mission mode. So don't get it. I don't either. It's really cool, though. Yeah, you can see this happen in, like, Bloodborne especially, where, like, if you look away from an enemy, like, off-screen, and then turn back, their, like, clothing pieces will go crazy, because they're, like, they freeze to, like, better optimize the game. It's neat. It's really cool. Oh, the skipping frames and the animations, MC and Mission spends their cloth physics. Yeah, look! See? I was right. Blanky mode. See, after the mission, the cloth is resumed, which can give the appearance of the movement as it settles. Yeah. It's particularly noticeable with the straw doll, straw doll because pretty much his entire head is affected by cloth physics. Yeah, Bloodborne has the the funny name dungeon. Oh, the fish! I'm hyped for this one. I love the giant koi fish with the creepy face. The great card represents the end of the state of the progression towards immortality, pursued by the fountainhead nobles. 
Look at that face. At the same time, it seems to be a critique against it. In similar fashion to vacuous rum and bloodborne. <gasps> rum! In both cases, their ascension from humanity brought limitations, restricting the benefits of their new state. Ron's transformation left her bereft of thought, and both are confined, able to leave their receptive lakes. I cryptid. Or cryptic, yeah, welcome. As a fish, the carp is literally dependent on the waters of the palace, the catalyst of its transformation and its prison. Look at those teeth! Cost of escaping death is seemingly uh, sacrificing your life, reducing yourself to something more and less than human. Oh, it's got human eyes, too. I want to pause in this frame. Look at all those teeth! Oh my god, that's so gnarly! Fish with teeth is already weird, but human teeth make it like ten times worse. Hang on, I'm thirsty. Sekiro consistently stresses that while immortality is highly coveted, an immortal life is a miserable existence. I got that in the game with like a lot of its uh, reoccurring themes. Oh, that was really cool. Just like be for real. <laughs> Fish go ah. Oh, did they make check out by accident? No. Centipedes, they don't seem to be otherwise cut to the centipedes missing Ashina as they're far from immortal. These guys. Oh, they're so tall! <laughs> so always crawling, it'd be hard to visualize how tall they are. They tower where Sekiro have made to stand. That's a that's a face. <laughs> the bulk of the centipedes are found in Senpu. One possible guess is that they are failed experiments. Hands and feet there across their body aren't they're in their flesh. Ooh. Also reason Senpu monks who do this uh, isn't made clear. They sit out among the care designs feeling that they're meant to be more important somehow. Put those grippers away! <laughs> I like these guys. They were a lot of fun to fight. They really like, uh, uh, like honed in the rhythm game part of Sekiro for me, which I liked a lot. Wait, in various locations? What? I only found them in one place. I feel like similar embassies with the limited mansion set. Maybe there's more going on with them than it seems. I've only seen this guy once. <laughs> If you can set the pot, we'll find a mystery cloud, or misty cloud, and a body arm clipping in front of the side. Their arm is probably the entire NPC, right? Turns out, no, it's actually a whole mist noble. Oh, it's a mist noble. <laughs> I love this. There's two? Okay. Check out break. Oh god, what happened? They hate each other. I I only found the one in uh in Senpu uh, uh in the Fountainhead area. Hang on, let me find out what's wrong with Chat Cat. Oh, Bikubot broke. That's what happened. Bikubot disconnected from my uh channel. Also, I don't want Christmas Chat Cat. Get out of here. <laughs> it's not Christmas anymore. Okay. Beakabot disconnected it briefly, but it's back now. There we go. Krimis. We got Drake on Chat Cat's head. Anyway. Gaming. Hang on, I'm waiting for scales. <laughs> That's cool. I wouldn't. I guess that. Uh, That's why I have them. Sometimes the Mr. Bull cloth is get very angry. Yeah, that's pretty angry. Ah, <gasps> monkey! This is the time on, on stream. 
for sure. Monkey. Thank you. Monkey. You can you can spam monkey here, but just here on the monkey ones. <laughs> Yo, give it for the raid. Welcome. Oh, hello. We're doing more video watching. Welcome. Monkey. Monkey. I'm. I am still monkey. proud that I found the monkey first. This one. Monkey. 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 I want to see this mechanic here where it like shows how it follows you. Maybe if you aren't looking, even when they're visible because they're supposed to be too obvious. That's if you go too far away while still looking at them. I love it. All things happen when they when you grapple. Monkey. Weeping angel monkey. <laughs> True. <gasps> monkey. My baby again. The fine dragon sits intertwined in the branches of a sakura tree. At the wait, is this the uh, dragon theme from? <gasps> it is. It's my favorite song from Breath of the Wild. That's Nadra. I love this song. Dragon and the tree are even closer than it seems. As dragon is likely the spirit of the tree itself. I love this design. Dragon's own body appears scarred with tree route, which parts of its scales peeling open to reveal sickly wood. Oh, what a cool character. The missing arm may also represent the aromatic branch taken from the tree by Tekiru. That's right. Tekiru to the divine branch. Further down, Morpus body is showing rot and is there branches merging from the wood patches. Shh. Look at that thing. Nature is amazing. <laughs> Ooh, you can see the whole model. Dragon's mouth is lined with protruding flower petals. Oh, that's a cool design. I love that idea. Like a, like flower petals for your mouth and teeth. That is so cool. Teeth brook. Horns also show signs of decay, which branches off having either rotted away in place or snapped off. Yeah, it is like the uh, two fingers from Elden Ring. You're right. Flower beard. Yeah. See more wood than horn or bone. Four limbs have five claws, with a sword arm has four, which further suggests either Korean or Chinese origin. Oh, neat. Wonderments are not visual effects, instead they're just part of the model with transparent scrolling textures. Hmm. It's a long boy. <laughs> that sounds like it's a long lad. Flourish and iridescent sheen across the parts of the wood are showing. The longest boy. Yeah, he must be like probably one of the bigger NPCs that we have in these games. If I always wanted to be part of last stream, sound fun. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Look how long. Oh my god. That's quite long, though. Nowhere near the snake, measuring at about 498 feet from nose to tail. Wah! Big boy alert. Wee woo, wee woo. Large lad. Hey, here he is. This guy again. Why is he muted? Check us not muted, he's just quiet. We're watching videos right now. So people aren't really redeeming much. Did the dragon ever do I've not actually played Demon Souls, so I wouldn't know that character. Robato! Robato! Okay. <laughs> cool video. <laughs> e. Yeah, see, he lives. There we go. The tallest NPC that from software's ever made. Yes, I want to see this. 
Hang it, Ripley. 626 feet tall. NBC is technically the tallest uh, from ever made. Referred to as... I don't even want to try to pronounce that in the files. This is a type of straw doll used for curses. Something you may be curious about is where exactly the files of these names are found. In most cases, they're written in English or at least Romanized Japanese in the NPC AI scripts. I have a question though, why is this mess NPC who only ever moves once in a cutscene needs AI scripts? Unfortunately, it no longer has animations, it's AI references, but its script suggests it may have been a boss. Oh, that'd be a cool boss fight. Let's compare the size of a few NPCs per perspective. Ceaseless, Dragon God, Straw Doll. Therefore, the straw doll is technically the tallest, but also worth remembering the longest NPC. <gasps> Noodle. Big snake. Oh my god. <laughs> it just keeps going. <laughs> Think we'll stop by now? Oh. Snake. Snake is 1,525 feet. Only two and a half times as long as Straw Doll. Oh my god. So I have to some large NPCs from Mermaid. What would we expect? An Elden Ring. <laughs> what could one expect from Elden Ring as far as tall? The Shichimin, seven base warriors, are fought in multiplications. But that is one long snake. It is. All these guys. I never actually beat these guys. I never like sat like tried to actually defeat them. They were very difficult for me. We get the camera too close and we see in Sekiro. They fade out. Looking at the object doppelganger. Oh. They're so gross. I love it. <laughs> there are definitely more than seven faces on here. At least two. Oh, snippy on top. It's a cool detail. Very neat. I hate how the, like, the rope around the waist looks like intestines. It's kind of meaty <laughs> in texture. No, this is not the monk. This is the, uh, Seven Faces. The enemy you fight in the caves with the terror stuff. There are three main variants of the Ishian in the files, surprisingly. See the Ishian has unique ID. Yeah, the Shishimin Warriors, those ones. Hi, Ishin. Ishin ought to be suffering from unknown illness, which can be seen in his shallow skin and discolored nails. Uh, also, Nulia, we are a PG-13 stream, so do not make weird comments. Mind the rules. Yeah, Ishin's face is very detailed. I like it a lot. Ishin you fight in the Shura ending, and Tengu Ishin has the same ID. It's also used for his corpse. Tengu outfit appears to be a modified version of what Knight's Jar Shinobi wear. True. Source Ishin has a few unique distinctions from the other Ishin variations. Yeah, I noticed that as well when I was like fighting Ishin, is his model is so detailed. 
And I really, really like that. Notice the beer being so different? Mm-hmm. Oh. So wide scar on his stomach and batching and small scar on his back. All versus Ishin have this. Oof, that's nasty. His hair is darker and his skin and nails look healthier. Yeah, this is his resur resurrection uh, mode. That makes sense. Came back healthy. Stock of Ishin's gun appears to be the same every or same dark wood as his bench, with similar gilded imagery. Ooh. In his prime, that's cool. <laughs> I think Ishin is super super cool. Honestly, I love his character a lot from what I've seen and fought in the first run. Man, I, I just love the detail in his model, my goodness. Also, welcome in, uh, Festu, hello. Yeah, he's like definitely just a really, really cool NPC entirely. I I hope to go back and like fight him in the other endings. Uh, and I know it's like a different boss fight where you can fight him in the place where you first fight Genichiro. <gasps> oh, this is the, this boss fight. I love these lanky, weird dudes. This boss fight. Yeah, this quote-unquote boss fight. I felt bad for this one. You must this gun's very detailed and adorned. I know nothing about guns, but I think it's cool, regardless. Yeah, boss fight in quotations. It's not a boss fight. I, I love how much the fingers move with the, uh, the loot. The Sengoku era was around the time that guns uh, were first introduced uh, to Japan via Portuguese. Oh, I see. Interesting. Is it going to show Wolf killing him at the end? <laughs> yeah, there it is. <clears throat> and bam, yep. <laughs> what I find cool about that, though, <clears throat> is like when we first meet these like fountainhead uh, nobles or whatever they're called, I forget, the Mist Nobles, yeah. It's that fight there where like we kill him in one hit and it makes you kind of think that they're not that like aggressive until you go to fountainhead temple and they're everywhere and they're very annoying and can cause you to like die very fast yo let's try to think of the raid welcome in raiders hello hello we are watching some sekiro lore videos today so welcome playing some more dabby delight we'd love to see the dabby Yeah, welcome in. Like I said, we're doing a little movie night today, uh, a Sekiro-themed movie night where I'm watching a bunch of uh, gameplay uh, stuff, behind-the-scenes videos, and lore videos about Sekiro. So, uh, get comfy. Finally, I can see where he goes when he falls. Robato! Ah. He goes into nothingness. <laughs> <laughs> and the item going back up is very good. I love that. You can do a second playthrough with the Yes, I am! Oh, Demon of Hatred! Oh. Welcome in, Uncle Hein. Hello. That sure is a prototype of the demon. <laughs> Yeah, 
He's bright? Uh-huh. Yeah, I didn't beat the, uh... There's the big lad. I did not beat the Demon of Hatred yet. I want to go back and, uh, and finish that fight. Larson Lion, Are yeah. we dead? <laughs> or is this Ohio? And, uh, welcome in Hero, and also, thank you for the follow from Happy Hammond. More about the dragon. Oh, cut content! Nice! It's a bigger cut content version of them? Oh. Have a good stream. Thank you! Oh, that is, oh I like the design, though, of this one. The, the bigger one. This tree, uh, and there are two entries for it. One with 15,000 hit points, one with 2,000 hit points. I suggest they may have been similar to the Four Kings with six physical NPCs and a hidden one as the group HP bar. I don't know if this has been in addition to two or is it the small tree fight? Big years? Yeah, big years. Once it appears very similar to the small trees, they fight probably wasn't much different. So neat. Cheese. Cheese. I think I do like the smaller fight more, though. I think the death blow you do, where you can like swing and hit a bunch of them at once, is so much fun. Animation is unfinished and leaves behind a non ragdoll corpse rather than fading out. Muckman Lanels, hello. Oh, this is just showing us how big the snake is. <laughs> We've already seen this. It's still very cool, though. Snake, snake, snake. There's a snake. My friend. Oh, God. I love snakes. I love this snake. They're so neat. Yeah, I love that. You flying? <gasps> this is Jeez. Bloodborne OSD. Oh! My favorite song from Bloodborne, too. How dare. I'm not sure what this is showing, but it's still very cool. Mm -hmm. We just flying. Is that it? It's just like a flying showcase. He went god mode. He did went god mode. Oh Jesus. Oh, they're manipulating the uh, the jump distance. That's what it is. <laughs> that's that's cool. One of the weirdest pieces of unused content any FromSoft game. Ooh, more unused content. My favorite. Oh. What in the world? This entire low detail hill model is an unused NPC. I don't know what it is for what or why its NPCs have map piece or object. Oh, that was short. <laughs> oh, they're playing as Kenichiro. Or no, uh, Gilbu on his horse. That's cool. I mean, they're not wrong. This is pretty much Elven Ring now, at this point. If you use the, the Gyobu model to fight. That's cool. Uh, I guess we'll try to skip the more, like, interesting ones. Monkey.
Yeah, I really did enjoy the Gilbu fight. Monkey. Very large monkey, monkey too big. So gruesome detail hidden in the Shura ending. Ah, spoilers. Can't watch that one. Costume pack mod. Oh god, god. Makeup in my eye. Ah. What in the world? Just like mods for different outfits? That's cool. Different characters you can play as. Monkey. And then just like the basket dude. That's pretty neat actually. I like that idea. That's that's neat. Uh and the rest is just stuff I can't watch yet or things I don't care about. So now we get to move on to watching a Vati videos about Sekiro. AKA like actual lore stuff. Um, let's see. Basket face, yeah. Um Did what what robot are you talking about, Floof? <laughs> my nightbot that is advertising my streams. Uh, and my subscriber things. Lore time. I, yeah, I'm excited. This is like the story parts. Um, I think I want to do like the, the bits in peace. Not like, not like the whole like half of the story. I wanted to get these like tiny parts. Ooh. Oh, I love these videos. Yeah, let's watch these ones. Uh, Savati does really good like um, things you missed in like secret videos for all the Souls games and Bloodborne. I want to watch these ones first. While this I eat my dinner. Floating passage. The combat art that's given to you by Pot Noble Harunaga, a carp scales vendor to the right of the Hirata Estates Bridge. And I bought it so that you don't have to. It's pretty bad. Large enemies will just poise through this long animation, and it achieves less than Whirlwind Strike, which also offers a cleave effect. Let me know if I'm missing something. Harunaga also offers a mask fragment, Let me know how the volume I'm sure is. many of you are wondering if it's worth investing in. If you find all three of these, then you receive the Dancing Dragon Mask, Ooh. a key item that allows you to exchange five skill points to increase your attack power Jeez. by one, something that you're probably more likely to make use of in the late game. Something you can use in this level though is the Withered Red Gourd. It restores when you sit at bonfires, just like your other one, and this one removes fire buildup, which is something you're gonna need when you stand in this fire along the estate path. This is where you'll find the Flame Barrel, which is an essential prosthetic weapon, and most of you probably found it. But yes. did you know that there's actually a really rare piece of dialogue that you can receive here? You have to stealth close to these soldiers without being seen, which is not an easy task, considering how many scouts there are in this little tiny section. Nearby the carp scalesmen are a couple of boats that some bandits likely used to come ashore, and reinforcing that theory is an item that's left behind on those boats, a Mibu possession balloon, which increases item drop from killing enemies, which Ooh. is obviously something you could imagine a bunch of pillaging <laughs> bandits in the using. Game. Across the way is Anayama, a talkative bandit who's set on looting the place. This explains why he has Lady Butterfly's phantom kunai later I, in the game. What? I want uh, he that. He speaks of some three-story pagoda up on some cliff, which is a tip that can lead you to a really, really well-hidden prosthetic weapon. I didn't find this on my first playthrough. So to find this, you take the first left on the bamboo thicket slope, and then you follow the river until you reach this outcrop, break through the old bamboo door, jump the walls what? up the mountain, and you'll face a purple cloak, which is a really tough enemy this early in the game. So this guy is one of 17 lone shadows. These are agents from the interior ministry, and this one is sitting and watching from his high perch while the bandits do all of their dirty work. You can beat him by getting good with your sheer getting skill. <laughs> uh, you can beat him in a lame way by running back down the mountain, then going back up again and killing him in stealth. Or you can use Vati's patented ankle chipping technique. 
Whatever you choose, open the pagoda and you'll be able to loot the Mist Raven's Feathers, which is the prosthetic- What? I- I miss this, obviously. But I want- that's so cool. Huh. Well, okay. that's now really I know, powerful I guess. against enemies that have really slow, heavy-hitting attacks, allowing you to get in a lot of health damage from behind. The final prosthetic weapon hidden in the estates is the loaded axe, and you're clued into one. its location by this man on the, the hunter axe, path, <laughs> who is furious about the bandit invasion. He's mute, one of many bodies food. in this area that are dressed in this blue garb, and it likely marks him as one of the high-ranking warriors of the Harata, Two other living men wear this same garb, and both of them claim to be from the Nugami family, which was a vassal family of the Harata, whose Harata estates are under attack from these bandits. And the Harata themselves are a vassal to the Ashina, who are pretty much as high as it goes in this region, although the Ashina are rapidly losing influence. Anyway, the first confirmed member of the family that we meet is Nogami Gensai. As he lets you know, he fought with the Ashina when they claimed this land, explaining his fierce loyalty to Ishin of the Ashina, and also the Divine Prince who he has been tasked with protecting. If he dies in the fight against Juzo, one of the bandits, he laments his failure to Lord Kuro. But if he survives the fight against Juzo, this is what he says. And if you kill him afterwards, you cement yourself in his eyes as a rogue shinobi without a family. Why would you kill him? <laughs> I I really like I didn't even think about that option. Why would I want to kill him? <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> I would never think about like, oh, I, this guy helped me fight the annoying boss. Let me just murder him afterwards for fun. But, okay. Name and without honor. It's not too wrong, honestly. The reason so many people here call us a rogue shinobi is likely because we were nowhere to be seen when the bandits attacked, despite already being the prince's shinobi. So mm -hmm. this is common knowledge among the town, and especially amongst the Nogami family, who pretty much all call you a rogue. But I wonder, and I don't know if anyone has this answer, but where were we during this attack on the Harata estates? Who lured That's us a good question. away? The mother of a couple of the Nogami men cowers inside. This scared maid will one day become one of many afflicted by your dragon rot. And considering Emma rot. talks often about the overflow that's associated with dragon rot, this scared maid appears to be traumatized by a vision of what's to come for her. Your master is deep in the mansion. My son, Inosuke, went to rescue him. So he's probably fine, but... This is Nogami Inosuke, a man who has barely survived his fight with Lady Butterfly. If you look closely at him, Ooh. you can see he actually has blood streaming down from both of his eyes, which I think has to do with the illusions that he's seen. Undoubtedly, Ooh. he saw something terrible, right? And maybe he clawed his own eyes out, or she made him claw his own eyes out as a way of escaping these illusions. Which is why Thanks. I think it's actually <laughs> a bit of a missed opportunity to not have these illusions mean something devastating to Sekiro. Instead, from what I can tell, they're just laborers with a sort of headscarf, which might mean something. It's probably more likely that they have to do with Lady Butterfly herself. Of course, this man is the exact same Nogami Inosuke we find in the Ashina outskirts three oh. years later, which explains now why he had those bands fully wrapped over his eyes. It's the same person! He was permanently crippled all those years ago in the Harata estates, oh, you, and you. now he has the lone task of looking after his mother. Now that we recognize that he was blind all this time, it explains why he says he remembers our voice. His mother, of course, is the one that gave us the bell, and Maybe it was her desire to help the prince that sort of linked us back to the Harata estates, recreating this memory with Buddha's help. Before, you go and die to Lady Butterfly a bunch of times. Now, in the first episode, is a really good time to tell you that not all shinobi walls actually have a human shape, clearly revealing them. Uh, scrolls, too, are something to look out for, because they 
often hide some seriously good loot. I a found that one. I was part of, wealth, of that, honestly. Divine confetti, a light coin purse, and meet again. most importantly, a prayer bead. As you run towards Lady Butterfly, again and again, like I did, spare a thought for this one enemy who has the worst recurring nightmare in the history of the Souls series. If you're wondering, though, there is a reason he's here, and it's because from Software knows how hard this fight is, and having him here allows you to refill your second resurrection bar on your way back to Lady Butterfly. Thank you, Bow Bandit. As you fight all of the mini bosses and bosses in this area, remember, most bosses actually come with a really significant prosthetic weakness. Lady Butterfly, for example, can be knocked off her wires with shurikens, and your spirit emblems can be restored in phase 2 by killing her illusions. Juzo is weak to the faded owl feather, as he has really slow attacks, and he's also a great candidate to light on fire. He's so slow and big that he's really easy to hit with oil urns, which allow you to set him on fire with one flame charge. In you know, I honestly really not... In like the later half of the game, I barely use prosthetics to use to like fight bosses. Instead of two. This means you can set him on fire a ton of times throughout the fight. And finally, the Shinobi Hunter. He suffers against firecrackers and shuriken use, which makes this difficult fight a cakewalk for most players. Yeah, I didn't After I didn't you defeat it, <laughs> Lady Butterfly, you awakened back at the dilapidated temple. However, if you return to her boss room, there's actually an idol here now that you can rest at. It seems like it serves no purpose, but you can sit here and use it to confront the memory of Lady Butterfly, and you'll learn a little bit more of our history with her. Long ago, Owl actually appointed her to teach us shinobi techniques, and they were Ooh. not teachings of a kind sort. Now, later in the game, it's possible to return to the Harata Estates, and the two tips that are going to follow relate to this area. I want to warn you, do not watch any further unless you have fought the second boss battle atop Ashina Castle. I will be spoiling who stabs you from behind. Okay, then I will skip. <laughs> That's gonna be a skip for me, because I haven't done that yet. You're supposed to die to Genichiro at the start of the game, but what if you don't? That thought was teasing me for weeks after the game's release, and as I got good against him, my mind began to race with ideas. Maybe he won't cut my arm off, and maybe I'll go through the game without a prosthetic arm. No way. What if I'm able to turn his bow into a prosthetic weapon? I thought maybe the credits will roll right here and now. Game over. What if it's just... Oh. Oh. At least, there's a little bit of lore here. Um, the Ashina combat style is all about victory at any cost, and True. Genichiro, using the ancient samurai cutscene technique, is definitely in keeping with that ethos. A shinobi know the difference between honor and victory. The divine heir is coming with me. As you head into the Ashina outskirts, still thinking about how you totally beat Genichiro and <laughs> it isn't fair, remember to head upwards and to the left as soon as you arrive at the cannon section. There's a memorial mob merchant yeah, up I here who sells these firecrackers for 500 sen, and it is one of the strongest prosthetic tools in the game. And as soon as you clear the cannon section, double back here before you fight the ogre. There's a merchant tucked away, and he's in a nook that you wouldn't really think to visit. Anayama, dressed in patches and tatters, patches. will mm, trade information people. for 150 sen before he upgrades his work. Interesting. That he's called patches. He has patches on him. Gee, I wonder. Ah, okay, I've switched back to Gremlin. My, let me get my big blanket on. Oh, it, my fur clips the rope. That's okay. Grim. Yeah. <laughs> Where's? Grim. His prized possession is the Phantom Kunai. It's this shuriken upgrade that you can purchase for 3,000 sen. And it takes a little while for you to work towards this, and one shuriken now costs two spirit emblems, but it's the best method you have, really, to do damage to enemies at a distance, and this is kind of good against bosses that require a little bit more health damage before their posture begins to fall. And... Anayama's ambitions have only just begun. Do you mind finding out what the Ashina Samurai Oh, that want definitely right is now? Patch's you voice actor. You're right. I can sell it to them. 
The Ashina are low on salt, having used it all up during their constant warfare. You can get this information on the bridge by the lake at the back of Ashina Castle. Next, he needs an assistant to help him loot the battlefield. There's a peddler named Anayama near Ashina Castle oh, looking for help. You should give him a- I meant to finish this guy's side quest too and like find out what he wanted. Oh, I missed this as well. Okay. And the perfect companion for Anayama to manipulate is Kotaro, a gentle giant Kotaro. found early on in Senpo Temple. Give Kotaro the red and white pinwheel and he'll come around to the idea. All right, I'll do it. I'll go and see. This unlocks a few more sugars and an infinite store of black gunpowder and scrap iron. But for the ending to their questline, I'm gonna keep you around till the end of the video because it contains spoilers. Okay. To the right of the cannon bearer is a hidden drop down to a ledge containing a bunch of good items. Uh, more interesting though is this bit of snake skin hanging I did notice this as well, the snake skin. It's a great little piece of environmental storytelling and it tells you that the snake really gets around this area. A couple of tips in these videos are going to be lifted from popular speedrunning strats. Um, the most useful one I've found so far is this way of dealing with the chained ogre. So you crush a gachin sugar, walk up to this brazier, and then take a sharp left. This enables a backstab while he's still chained, and it's a good idea no matter how experienced you are, because let's be honest, we've all been hit by this grab attack. We sure After have. After you defeat the ogre, you can actually take a fairly pointless shortcut to headless if you like. This gap in the wall enables a wall jump to this ledge, allowing oh. you to open this door from behind and enabling you to die to headless faster. <laughs> if you didn't know, all headless enemies drop spiritful consumables, which are infinite use versions of the sugar items that consume three spirit emblems. They don't last quite as long, but if you have two divine confetti handy, then you have a shot at beating this headless, which drops my favorite sugar, Akko. And while we're here, did you know that Sekiro actually has a passive ability called Look, Night Eye? I love it. It's explained in one of the loading screens, and you can actually see it activate when you're in a dark place. It's got night eyes, speaking like of a eyes. wolf. After this encounter, oh. Oh, look yeah. to the right of the first idol you come across. You'll find a small Senpo assassin who dreams of marrying the Great Serpent. This is weird. <laughs> So kill him, and you'll receive the Herb Catalog scrap, which details where exactly to offer oneself. This explains I'm the sorry. palanquin within the valley, as they're- They want to marry the giant snake? They're so real for that. Welcome in, Otacon. I want to go back and see that. Snake waifu. <laughs> That's weird. Kill him. I also want to marry the big snake. I want to read this item uh, real quick. A page from Ashina Herb Catalog, a flower compendium, snap seed, naturally grows in ravine, or ravines and deep valleys. Oh, that's right. I also didn't get past the snake in the in the caves. Wolf, thank you so much for the raid. Yay, snake marriage. Yep. Snake marriage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, welcome in. Thank you for the raid. I hope you had a good just chat stream. We're doing a little Sekiro movie night. We're watching a bunch of Sekiro lore videos and uh, just relaxing. Uh, we're just watching some Avati videos, uh, pieces about uh, Sekiro. I love this, though. If one wishes to become a bride, they must enter the belly of the serpent in the valley. <laughs> Jesus. Which details where Welcome exactly in, snipers. Well, hello. Himself. Welcome, welcome. This explains the palanquin within the valley, as there are two examples in the <gasps> oh, game of these right. being used for marriage, and them being used in this really formal ceremony might explain why the snake briefly stops its aggression towards us when it spots us going inside. In an earlier video, we talked about what happens if you don't take the second death blow on main bosses. So maybe something will happen to you if you don't take a second death blow on the snake later on. Hmm. hmm. Your first death blow on <laughs> Gyobu refills a resurrection, which you can use to get an extra line of dialogue out of him. Quite a few main bosses react in this way. Astonished True. that you're still able to stand, he says. Still you stand! Still you stand! Genichiro has many burdens! And I consider you one of them! A third resurrection <laughs> is possible with a Jizo statue, and while Gyobu says nothing here, this technique will be used in our next video, which is about Ashina Castle, which reveals a fascinating little piece of lore about a character here, so 
subscribe, and click the notification bell thing as well, so you don't That's miss really it. That's really cool, I love now, that. After Gyobu, go up the staircase and have a chat with the guy in the Tengu mask. He gives you a task, to kill rats, vermin that he says are creeping about Ashina's lands. Welcome Senpo in assassins count as rats, and there's a group of them to the right of the castle gate. Go up there, kill them, then go back, and you receive the Ashina skill tree, which includes honestly probably the most powerful abilities in Sekido. True, uh, true. You've got deflection enhancements, you've got enhancements to combat, and it also contains, at the end, what is arguably Ooh, the, the best combat art either. in the game. Ichimonji double. But we'll talk about combat arts in another video. Oh, Above, yeah, Ishin uses that attack in the boss fight. Accessible a few ledge hangs is a set of prayer beads, which you might have missed. And I should also mention there's a gourd seed around the corner at the memorial mob. Just remember, you have to scroll down. I appreciate how gimmicky and well presented the blazing bullfight is, right? But this fight probably is one of the less enjoyable fights in the I game. I honestly forgot Luckily, about this boss fight because it, it was so you annoying. Only do this on New Game Plus because you do miss out on a prayer bead. So you hop up to this guard tower, you ledge jump at an angle off this wall, and you grapple onto the ledge. Go to the top of the roof, run off at this exact angle as late as you can, and sort of curve your character around the tree. Take your second jump right here, and pray. You know what, after doing this like for 20 minutes, I think I'll Ooh, just fight cool. the bull next time. To a little like boundary your prayer breaks in these games. And your devotion, you arrive at this old woman right after the skip, actually. Show her how devoted you are by consuming all of your important items in front of her. As a reward for praying, you get other items of equal value. Ooh, confetti. <laughs> uh, the third prayer nice. does net you some divine confetti, which is a pretty rare item this early in the game, so it's worth it for that. On the bridge opposite this woman are two really nondescript soldiers. It's easy to run past them, but don't, because one of them actually drops the gatehouse key, which you can use in the reservoir to loot Gyobu's broken horn. <gasps> so before Ooh, some of you type, cool. I learned nothing new from this video, did you know that the horn itself is from Gyobu's own helmet? It was snapped off during the rebellion, and that its description reveals that after he was defeated, Ishin Ashina was so impressed by Gyobu's strength that he awarded him with the spear of none other than Shuzen Tamura, the same general that we see Ishin defeat in the opening cutscene. As we talked about in the Hirata Estates video, this is Inosuke, a man blinded and crippled during his fight with Lady Butterfly. Years later, his mother gives us the means to travel back to the Harata Estates, talking about the Divine Prince endlessly. Mm -hmm. But did you know that when you kill Lady Butterfly, both her and her son die? Oh, that's the right. Master. They do die together. The events of the past have been resolved. <laughs> the following four facts are really good, but they take place after acquiring the Mortal Blade, and after completing the final sequence of the game. As always, I have an escape route. You can go click the merch link down below and it'll evacuate you from this video to a safer place that's spoiler free. Nice. Because you shouldn't continue watching if you have not finished the game. I finished During the game. During the siege of good. Ashina Castle, you can take a shinobi kite to the Ashina outskirts, unlocking an invaluable section of the game. Herein, at the outskirts wall stairway, is probably the best farming location in the game. So from the statue, simply head backwards towards the bridge, backstabbing all the way, and you'll receive a boatload of XP, gold, and rare upgrade materials. 17. Maybe it's best if you did miss this one, honestly. When we left Anayama, he was overjoyed with the companion we brought him, but oh. now, during the siege of Ashina Castle, he's bitten off more than he could chew. <laughs> they took it all! My money, my stock, everything! But... Kotaro drove them away, at no. least. No! Oh, Kotaro. <laughs> oh, the big guy's fallen asleep. Yes. He's sleeping soundly. Please, don't make that face. There's nothing for you to be sad about, good sir. Yes, there is. I like that guy. Oh, that's right. Good sir, I stowed away something good. Something just for you. My last piece of product. <laughs> Interested? Did someone the say smithing time when the line is to give you the promise note? It only me. costs one. Hum. Sounds like SM it is that coffee flavored fish cakes on the table? Nom. Mlum mlum mlum. Oh my god, I can feel everything.
I can taste everything. I can half a sun. Gasp I will now fight the sun and after I beat IT I will then control the moon. Mumra I must go now. Those planets need me. Smeefnium. Okay, check it. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> anyway. One cent, but it discounts the cost of Aim. all <laughs> items by 10%, which is a nice boost because you're going to want to clear out merchant stock before New Game Plus, and Ooh. it carries over into the beyond. True. A sen saved is a sen earned. Unfortunately, this is the end of Anayama and Kotaro. Well, they both die. After you Jeez. acquire the mortal blade, don't forget to give a merciful death to Hanbei, the undying. And as he prepares for death, he reveals I the name so of a close friend. I miss so much stuff in this game. Splendid. <laughs> I miss so much stuff. I must give my thanks to Sekijo. Sekijo is the sculptor, a man who Hanbei understandably would have become close to after guitaro. all of his immortal years. For just as Sekiro translates roughly to one-armed wolf, Sekijo would translate roughly to one-armed orangutan. Oh. That's because Ro translates to wolf, and there's something called a shoujo, which is a sort of Japanese monkey spirit. Uh, it has a red face, red hair, and a fondness for alcohol, which are descriptions that fit the sculptor, uh, especially as you'll see in the next few facts. I... I didn't consider, like, helping this man sever his immortality. Oh, Later in the gotta game, go back and do that for Emma sure. leaves to tend to Kuro and Ishin at the top of Ashina Castle. And while she's gone there, during the siege of Ashina, the sculptor, too, takes this opportunity to leave. If you talk to the merchant here around this time, he mentions that the sculptor left, muttering something about the flames. And past flames. the corpses of Anayama and Kotaro, past this squadron of government soldiers and past some red-hot claw marks, there is the demon of hatred yeah, terrorizing the landscape. Yeah, I also beat this, this boss fight too. This is It's the sculptor, engulfed by Shura's wrath. So Sekiro himself Wait, recognized I'm sorry, the sculptor what? when I fought Hang on, run that back. Him. Shura's wrath. Hot claw marks. There is the demon of hatred terrorizing the landscape. This is Sekijo. It's the sculptor, engulfed by The demon of hatred is the fucking sculptor? Excuse me? What? What? My mind has been blown. Holy shit. That is so cool. He gave into the hate in his heart. Oh my god, that would explain the one arm just like he said. I didn't get his whistle. I didn't get- I didn't get his whistle. <laughs> Spoiled. I mean, I I, I said earlier that I, I'm going to pick and choose what I want to be spoiled. This is okay. So I chose to not finish this boss fight. <laughs> nice try to get me a little gotcha there, buddy, but I'm aware what I'm watching. <laughs> I didn't finish this boss fight because it was too fucking hard. This is Shura's so cool. Rough. So Sekiro himself recognized the sculptor when I fought him, which, as I would come to realize, is because... I eavesdropped a lot, and I shared a lot of sake, which led to my character figuring out who the Demon of Hatred is. If you don't do these things throughout the game, Sekiro does not recognize the Demon of Hatred, but the Demon of Hatred always recognizes you at the end. Oh, it speaks too! Wow, wow, wow. I hope you're preparing to cry over the next few weeks. <laughs> this old woman always was foreshadowing a demon appearing, because back then she asks, where do you think all that hatred from the war, where do you think it goes? And now her dialogue here, at the end, depends on whether you knew the demon's identity this whole time, and of course, now you do. To carve and sculpt <sighs> Buddhas for so long, only to be wreathed in the flames of hatred and turn into a demon. It was the fate he made for himself. To pay for his own mistakes. And you put an end to that. You sent him on his way. I'm sure he's grateful for that. Damn. I know, you're all aching for a lore video. And while I do have them in the works, trust me, uh, I enjoy talking about the gameplay more right now. That's fair. Uh, as you all wrap up your own playthroughs. 
It's actually been a difficult last few months. Uh, I have to balance the needs of my firstborn child, who was born in January, Aww. and I also have to balance the needs of YouTube and Twitch and also Teespring as well. He's a so dad. Thank you for being patient. Um, big thank you to all of you who actually bought a t-shirt over the last few weeks. It's doing really well. I didn't think anyone wanted merch, but now I'm at the point where I think I should actually work with an artist every month and throw a ton of money at them so that they can make cool designs for you guys, which if you know me, you probably know that I dig that sort of stuff. I love it. Um, but I'll see you next time. Remember to ring the bell. Wow, that's if you amazing. Want to be notified I, of new videos. Why, this is why I love from soft games. Like this boss fight is entirely optional. Um, you know, you don't have to fight the demon of hatred. But if you don't fight, you're missing like this really cool like lore about Sekijo. Because I didn't even think about that. Like that is so cool. I. Oh, I love it. Like, I definitely want to go back and fight this boss after I get what I've missed in the game before everything else. Oh, but man, that's amazing. Just, it's always these bosses. These, like, bosses you don't have to fight to finish the game have incredible lore attached to them. That's just so cool. Uh, let me get to one chat. Uh something very heartbreaking about people wanting to die yeah um it's like uh it's definitely a, a common theme in these games is like the characters who want to like <laughs> who want to stop living because it's too much for them it's so sad but it's it's really good character building especially in in Sekiro where the whole theme is immortality and welcome in Frisk and they were the fall from Black Glacier There we go. Next one. Sekiro is tough. Even for Souls fans. Fever's Nameless King. Yeah, I still need to go. Especially for Souls uh, fans, actually. Do your the muscle memory Dark Souls works lore videos you and learn about game. Dark Souls. But instead of leaving an embarrassing review on Metacritic, stick with it. Because honestly, the combat could become your favorite of any From Software game, like it has for me. This video contains mm -hmm. tips for those that are struggling and also oh. fascinating little details that I guarantee. I'll pick out kind of skim through this one because I don't really uh, I already I've already played the game so I really don't want like I don't want to like learn how to I don't want to learn mechanics uh Sekiro Osu hang on fast enough another reason spam tapping is important is because of another mechanic called consecutive deflect which increases the posture damage you do for deflecting multiple hits in a row. Here he is. Many enemies have flurry attacks. Uh, these are attacks that are a huge opportunity for you. Oh, no, it's okay, for Charles. You. It was vague you enough, Brian. I don't, I don't know what you're attacks. talking about. It's Sing okay. the pacing in your head. <laughs> also, for have a example, good night. this uh, enemy oof. is one, two, three, four, four five. One, two, three, four, four five. One. And yeah. now yeah. I'm actually happy to see this attack coming my way. Sekiro is, in no small way, a rhythm game. Mm -hmm. If you do take an unblocked hit, you'll actually notice your character falling off balance. This stumble can be resolved by blocking or dodging. And as you can probably guess, blocking is better. Your recovery is actually immediate if you turn it into a deflect. Enemies can get perfect deflects as well. And while they don't reduce your posture, they do affect the flow of your attacks giving you a brief pause and putting you back to the and first can, attack can in your sequence. Get this one. Enemies this can is a use good video though, like I didn't, it's nice that there's a video to explain to folks who did quit Sekiro because it was too hard to be like, you know, you can watch this and kind of learn stuff. I honestly do think this is like, the combat in this game and the movement style is just incredible. I I uh I know a lot of folks when I was streaming the whole playthrough would like come into chat and like talk about how they didn't finish the game. It was too hard. Yo, thank you, Camera, for the raid. Welcome in. Hello. Hi, Jacques. Get comfy, Raiders, get your popcorn and snacks. It's movie night. Oh, you're playing Elden Ring, heck yeah. Well, welcome in, y'all. Uh we are just watching some Sekiro uh fun fact and lore videos, because I beat the game last week. Uh so yeah. It's a little uh like Vati video binge for Sekiro. <laughs> it's been lovely. Uh but yeah, we're doing a big vibe. Big oh congrats, thank you. I missed a lot of stuff in the main game. Uh but I'm learning about like what I can go back and do. So it's been uh it's been neat. 
Um, we're gonna skip this video though, because again, I uh, I don't want to learn this. But this is a folklore video. It's no secret that From Software's games are heavily inspired. Dark Souls, for example, features many references to Kentaro Miura's Berserk. Yeah. Bloodborne is undeniably inspired by Lovecraft. Yeah. And you know, even Slashy Souls is inspired by money. <laughs> However, among money. all of their titles, none of them are actually more inspired or more present than Sekiro, which actually takes place within a real historical context. And it's brimming with references that will be understood by a Japanese audience, but might pass over a Western one. So sit back, relax, and let us contextualize some of the most fantastic stories within this game. Ooh, I'm really happy for this video. One such story is that of the corrupted monk, the infested who guards the entrance to the Fountainhead Palace. While the game describes her immortality as this befitting quality for an eternal watcher of the palace, we never really learn how she became immortal. That is, until we consider the folklore she is likely inspired by. The corrupted monk's true name is Priestess Yao, a likely her. reference to the legend of Yao Bikuni. So as the tale goes, a fisherman once caught this unusual fish and he decided to invite his friends around to sample its meat. However, one of the guests peered into the kitchen while the meal was being prepared and he noticed that the fish had a human face. He warned the others not to eat it, and instead they wrapped their portion of fish in paper and took it home with them. But one man, who was drunk on sake, he forgot to throw his piece away, and he gave it instead to his daughter. The next morning, he freaked out, but the girl had appeared to suffer no ill effects at all, so he thought nothing of it. But over time, she tragically began to outlive everybody around her. Oof. It turns out the fish was a niño, a sort of niño. mermaid, and its flesh had imparted immortality to the daughter, who eventually became known as Yao Bikuni, the 800-year-old Buddhist priestess. Oh. This is a perfect example of how folklore can deepen our understanding of Sekiro because the corrupted monk is infested with centipedes, and centipedes are the thing that impart immortality in Sekiro. So the implication Ugh, is that gross. Priestess Yao can trace her immortality to the carp that's infested with centipedes below Fountain Oh yeah, Lake, we saw the carp, I saw like that. Just like yeah. traces her immortality to the Nino. The very bottom the of the fountainhead. The monk is not the only warrior monk we see in game, and in fact we get to see and fight a great deal of them at Senpo Temple upon Mount Congo. While this area is a part of Ashina, Hello everybody, if no one has Ashina told you today, you are beautiful are and you are loved. I hope everyone has an amazing night and enjoy the stream. Okay, sorry, I was just checking something on my end. Anyway. ...of a more separate group, rather than trusty vassals. Yeah, I state. know. It's like Indeed. endless life. Centipedes inside you. No thank you, I'm good. Similar warrior monk groups actually existed in medieval and feudal Japan. They emerged during the Heian period fueled by really fundamental disagreements on Buddhist teachings between temples. And at first, these warrior monk groups cared for nothing but fighting one another. Yet, with the flow of time, they began to accumulate power as well. The Genpei War even saw commanders giving presents to temples as an attempt to get these warrior monks to fight on their side. And that, however, only lasted until the end of the Sengoku period, where Tokugawa Ieyasu and Oda Nobunaga saw warrior monks as a threat to the government, so they were the first to directly oppose them. As a result of Tokugawa's efforts, warrior monks ceased to exist by the time he became shogun in the 17th century. Uh, you want to plan to watch? Oh, yeah, I've actually played. Well, okay, I have played through all of Dark Souls One. Uh, I played Dark Souls 3, and then I got through about what I would say is three-fourths of the way through Dark Souls 2. And then my SSD crashed and got corrupted, so uh, Steam does not do cloud saves for Dark Souls 2. So I lost my Dark Souls 2 save file. And I had made so much progress in that game. And I do really enjoy Dark Souls 2. 
But the idea of going through all that again, I've, I've taken a little break from that game and coming back to it. <laughs> um, I probably do want to like finish Dark Souls 2 before I do the full lore dive, because I have actually heard um, very vaguely that Dark Souls 2's lore is really, really good with its characters and bosses. Um, but yeah, we're going to do a really big stream for Dark Souls. I'm going to have two guests on my stream for that. Um, it's going to be Trakillian and Shinala are going to be my two like friends on stream because they are both really into Dark Souls lore. Sounds painful. Yeah, I know. Because again, I honestly, I, I know a lot of people have gripes with Dark Souls too. I understand. Um, my personal gripe is just the, um, the enemy tethering is really annoying and makes it very like frustrating to try and get through the game being followed everywhere by enemies. But atmosphere and story wise, I was loving it. I just, you know, after that big loss of losing so much progress, I just, you know, it hurts too much to go through it again. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, we're going to do a big and lore speaking night. Speaking of Tokugawa and his administration, the Interior Ministry in Sekiro is likely the greatest threat that the land of Ashina has ever seen. In the final act of the game, we see the Ministry's warriors cutting through the samurai of yeah, that's Ashina what I'm saying. as if the chasing, they were nothing, the enemy is insane pretty much in Dark Souls 2. It's unforgivable. <laughs> and yet, while the words Interior Ministry is thrown around a lot, the question of who stands behind the actions of the Interior Ministry is never raised or never answered. However, there are certain hints that the in-game interior ministry are warriors of real-life Tokugawa Ieyasu, mm -hmm. which is evidenced by several things. First, the emblems on their armor. They look really similar to the Tokugawa family crest. Oh, that's so cool. The red cool. troops, the Akazone, was an elite group under the command of one of Tokugawa's generals in real life. And as for the ministry itself, we should note that the Japanese word naifu does not actually even mean interior ministry. Instead, it means interior minister, which was a government title in Japan. Tokugawa Ieyasu was actually an interior minister during the final years of the Sengoku era. Thus, we can conclude that the Ashina clan might not be fighting an organization, but rather a man. And that man was most likely Tokugawa. This, in my opinion, is a bit of a missed opportunity to have a concrete antagonist the flute, yeah. for my the forces as of as well. the it's funny. instead of just the shadowy interior ministry. Now that we've talked about Ashina's enemies, let's move on to their great hero. Oh, Ishin's sword saints. title, the Sword Saint, is not just this fancy turn of phrase, it's actually an existing honorary title that was given only to the best of swordsmen. One of such saints in real life is Ito Itosai Kagehisa, who might have even served as an inspiration for Ishin. Little is known of Ito, except that he was an outstandingly skilled combatant, proficient with both sword and spear, and skilled to such an extent that many actually considered his powers supernatural. But here's the main thing. Ooh. One of the fundamental principles of Ito's techniques was Musoken, which is reacting to the enemy's attack, not as this conscious effort, but instead reacting spontaneously without thinking. Musoken is similar to Mushin, a technique that shares its name with the Mushin esoteric text developed by Ishin himself in game. So, these two are also similar, in the sense that both of them actually named sword techniques after themselves. <laughs> Ito developed the Ito Ryu, which is the one-stroke school, and Ishin developed a combat art called One Mind. One Mind. The final detail is that Ito's sword was also made by sword makers from the Ichimonji school, which Ichimonji. obviously <laughs> bears the same name as this combat yeah, art. Yeah, the game. combat art. <laughs> that is so cool. Another legendary combatant in the world of Sekiro is Tomoe. She may not be present during the events of the game, yet there's no doubt that she had a huge influence on this world. Genichiro was her student, and Ishin was her admirer, and I think she was undoubtedly inspired by Tomoe Gozen, a legendary figure who is just as much of an enigma as her in-game counterpart. Ah, queen. So we don't know much about her, we don't know who her parents were, we don't know where and when she was born, and some scholars even doubt whether she existed at all. 
But the only thing true to all records is that she was a certified badass. <laughs> Tomoe Gozen is described Work as an boss. accomplished archer I and love it. a mounted warrior. A woman who was prepared to confront both demons and gods. A warrior equal to a thousand men. She served her master loyally until he ordered her to leave his side during his final battle. This was either done out of fear that Tomoe's death would be more glorious than his own, or maybe because he wanted her to spread word of his fate. We don't know much about what happened in this legendary situation, just We're as we don't know much about what exactly. Tomoe's life was like after It's that. on record. Tomoe was of the Okami, and the center of worship for the Okami- I was gonna say earlier, I've, I've talked about this a lot in like, uh in both Dark Souls and Bloodborne, but this game as well, I really enjoy how- Oh, thank you for the two months of tier one, Xavier. Thank you. Two month. Two month. Wow. Thank you, Xavier8202 for the resub. Sip, sip, lem mm -hmm. lem. And thank you for the follow from Jojo Hartwood. But what I was gonna say was like, I really uh, like how FromSoft Games had this like ongoing theme of using like older aged characters to be like they're really strong. Uh, bosses. Cheese. Like a lot of enemies you or bosses you fight in the main games are like older or like you know really up there in age. Like Ishin is this like you know old sick man who's very frail Ayo. when you meet him, and then when you fight him at the end, he's like extremely tough. And then you have Garamin from Bloodborne, and then a couple. I, again, I don't know Dark Souls character lore yet. I will eventually, but. There are a few, like, you know, female and also older characters that we fight in these games. Gwyn! Gwyn! There we go, yeah! Like, Gwyn as well is just, like, old, uh, sort of, uh, I, decrepit, I guess, character that we meet at the end in this area of Ash. And you walk up thinking nothing of it, and then, oops, he's a badass, and he's gonna get you. <laughs> I love it. I just like that they diversify the enemy types and boss types in these games. It's, it's awesome. ...was the Sakura Dragon from the West. And the West is a really broad term. And while most people, including me, speculate this to mean that yeah, I think the origins also are from China in the Cinder, West, yeah. there is also evidence that the dragon could be of Korean origin, another place yes, to the West. Yes, I did finish our Soul So 3. the first fact supporting this is that Eastern countries all had a tendency to perceive dragons as about, water themed uh, creatures. And Lin -Lin Koreans Kwan in particular believed that dragons could control rain, fog, lightning, and thunder. Another argument is that the sword the dragon is carrying heavily resembles the seven branched sword, which is actually one of Japan's national treasures. Oh. According to the historical documents oh. and the inscription on the blade, this sword was a gift Japan's ruler received from an ancient Korean monarch. Geographically, Korea is also situated to the west of Japan, so Korea could be the home we return to to return the dragon's blood in the end. Oh. As for the dragons in Japanese mythology, there's a dragon god of rain in the Shinto pantheon that shares its name with the Okami clan, Okami no Kami, or Kura Okami, a legendary deity of rain and snow. However, there actually exists another version of this legend where this dragon split into two different deities, Taka Okami no Kami, dragon god of mountaintops, and Kura Okami no Kami, the dragon god of valleys. Oh, so these I two in this oh. alternate legend are one and the same, both of them together presiding over rain. And these two align really well, as you can guess, with the in-game divine dragon there they who presides are. over mountaintops, I love him. and the serpent god who presides in the valleys. In-game, this dragon and the serpent are also linked by their followers, seeing as the Sunken Valley Clan are descendants <laughs> of <beloved>. the Okami. <laughs> Additionally, this My might beloved. also explain why the serpent's viscera is required to create the cradle to escort the divine dragon's heritage back to the west. These two creatures are linked, and it kind of makes sense that they might be two sides of the same whole, just like in the Japanese legend. It's worth noting that snakes and dragons in Japanese folklore were mostly interchangeable with one another, in the sense that often one version of a legend would have a dragon in it, and just as often the same legend would feature a serpent. Thus, the connection between the divine dragon and the serpent god 
may be deeper than it first appears to a Western audience. Hmm, I like that. That's really cool, honestly. Another source of immortality in Sekiro, besides the dragon's heritage, are centipedes. Centipedes! That too have a certain place in Japanese culture. So while dragons were highly revered, centipedes on the other hand were never popular among the Japanese people. They were seen as impure, polluted animals associated with death and even regarded as yokai, malevolent spirits. And while the game never presents us with a direct confrontation between the divine dragon and the centipedes, there is a Japanese folktale called Towara Toda which features such a plot. So, a man named Fujiwara was on a journey when he noticed a giant serpent blocking his way. First, he was startled, but then he eventually plucked up his courage and walked on the serpent's back until he crossed to the other side. The great serpent, impressed by the man's courage, then reappeared before the man in his true form, that of a dragon king. He requested the man's aid with killing his enemy, the centipede living on Mount Mikami and Fujiwara agreed. Battling the monster, however, proved difficult. The hero shot one arrow, then another, and yet neither arrow hurt the beast even a little bit. He then remembered one of the centipede's greatest weaknesses, human saliva. Fujiwara Ew. spat on his arrow, shot it right onto Ew. the beast's eye, and it <laughs> fell dead. It's a great missed opportunity that no similar mechanic made it into the game. I'm so, no, I don't want to use spit in a my games. Host Thank for you. The centipedes in the game <laughs> are the infested monks that we see in Sempo Temple, whose infestation has become a symbol of worship. These monks' design was almost definitely inspired by the real life Buddhist monks who actually underwent a process called Sokushin Butsu. A process of self mummification. Yeah, the, the, uh, in yeah which this thing. I know about They this. would actually mummify their own bodies while they were still alive. Yeah. In order to succeed in this, it. a monk should first follow a really strict diet. They eliminated all of the fat in their bodies, and then he had to also stop consuming any type of liquid so that <laughs> his organs would shrink. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't want. <laughs> I, Vati, I love you, buddy. But he talks about using spit as a missed opportunity. I don't want to go. <laughs> And like, before I fight enemy in my games, thank you. I don't want to charge my spit meter. Thank you very much. Let me fix my uh, lip sync, by the way. It's a bit... That's better. Only I think where the spit is dead rising. I had never played those games before, but gross. <laughs> and he would begin to mummify. Oh, questions Monks that be... would die, <laughs> reciting a mantra over and over again, perpetuating themselves in a meditating pose. This practice was popular in a mountain-dwelling version of Buddhism called Shugendo, and, in fact, there is a checkpoint named Shugendo in the mountainous parts of Senpo Temple. That is so... I love all these, like, callbacks to, like, Japanese, like, history and folklore. The last secret for today will be about one of the first NPCs we meet in-game, the Sculptor. As we learn from conversations with Emma, his old nickname from his shinobi times was Orangutan. Hanbei, one of the Sculptor's friends, actually calls him Sekijo, Sekijo. which is a play on the Japanese word for Orangutan, which is Shoujo. A shoujo is synonymous with being a heavy drinker, a meaning that originated in a play. In the play, shoujo are presented as this race of intelligent spirits with long, shaggy red hair and an extreme fondness for sake. This video was written with the help of Zerail, who <laughs> you can learn more about in the description. In, uh, she taught me and so many of us about Japanese culture and history, so if you're interested, you can actually go read more of her posts over on Reddit. But thank you for watching. This is probably time. my favorite video is the the folklore tie-ins with the... Sekiro. That is a that is just amazing. Like again, he talked about it in the start of, the, of his video, uh, how um, both Dark Souls and Bloodborne have their influences where Dark Souls influences itself from Berserk and other things as well. And then Bloodborne uh, while also going into some Japanese folklore, also does take a lot of inspiration from uh, Lovecraft stories. But I think Sekiro definitely takes the cake there with like all the naming references and such. Like that is next level. That's so cool. Uh, anyway, this is the. Yeah, that would explain the red hair on the Demon Hatred and the missing arm as well. This is, uh, 50 things you missed in Sekiro. The game, at this point. Right? Right? Nope.
So, I've decided to compile my last 50 secrets for Sekiro into one video instead of three, because after this it might be time to move on. Let's begin with what might be the best secret on this list. In the Shura ending, Al orders Wolf to forsake his master, with the intent to take Kuro away from the lands. Boop 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 boop, this is spoilers. <laughs> anyway. As that dialogue reveals, Al's real name is Usui, which links him to a place called Usui's Forest, a mystical place mentioned in two item descriptions. First, it's mentioned in the Mist Raven Feathers, belonging to what? one of the many mystical birds that reside within Usui's forest. Mostly strawberry. And second, in the Phantom Kunai item, which reveals that Lady Butterfly trained in Al's forest since childhood, a place filled with mist and mystifications, which somewhat explains the shinobi that Al Yes, became. I am playing the other endings. In our first fight mm -hmm. with Al, he'll recite different parts of the shinobi code after each death we experience at his hand. First, that the parent is absolute, yes. and if you unlocked a second resurrection during the fight mm -hmm. by performing a death blow, then you hear that second, the master is absolute. But what very few people know is that there's a third rule, one that's never mentioned unless you unlock a third resurrection by consuming a Jizo statue during the fight. Three, fear is absolute. Fear there is absolute. no shame in losing one battle. But you must take revenge by any means necessary. Hammer down. <laughs> I wonder if you've got it in you to bring me down. It's no surprise that Al is one of Miyazaki's favorite bosses in Sekiro. Before launch, he gave this interview Mumphy, where he stated I've been learning that his Spanish. favorite boss I wanna show you what really I've learned. Sme. Tricks that, that means that Sme. Cool. That he hopes that we'll know it when we see it. It has to be Al, right? For this fight has this fantastic flavor to it. It's a boss that knows how to disable our heal, one that can use Makiri, and most impressive to me, he's the first boss that actually has trickery just built into his animations. Owl can use Makiri on you? I never use the charge attacks. I didn't even think about that. I, I rarely use like the whole charge stab. I didn't think it was very like good in boss fights, especially during with Owl's fight, which is so fast paced. <laughs> Cheese. But I, I do love the idea of a boss using Makiri against you. The, the Makiri kind of carried my entire playthrough. <laughs> That's really neat. Uh, oh. That's weird. I like hit all my tabs for some reason. I got scared. Anyway. He starts feigning attacks just as soon as you get used to countering them. His gameplay mechanics reflect his character design, which I think is a really worthwhile design goal for oh, yeah. any developer. Up here, as Ashina Castle is being besieged by the Interior Ministry, the soundtrack takes a bit of a turn. Listen to this part, mm -hmm. and tell me if anything sounds familiar. Ooh. You guessed it, that strained sound is the same one that we heard back in the 10 second Shadows Die Twice teaser. In this same area, earlier in the game, we fight Genichiro, and we see his second phase here, the Way of Tomoe. But did you ever wonder why he strips his metal armor off here? It could be because his flesh is astoundingly resilient anyway, thanks to the rejuvenating sediment. It could be that the Way of Tomoe favors flowing, unhindered movement. Or my favorite idea is that his metal armor might conduct electricity, oh. and things are about to get heretical up in here. That, to prepare that, that's for the a good invasion, point. warriors of the Ashina pour over a map within the Ashina Dojo. The map depicts the area that you're in right now. Here's the main castle, mm -hmm. the lake, the path to the sunken valley, to the outskirts, and back down the main road. Just around the corner from this map <laughs> is a tiny little shrine on the wall, one that's dedicated to what can only <gasps> oh, be the, the divine, divine dragon. dragon. Its distinctive oh, face so is cool. recognizable, as is the body twisted around the stump of the Sakura tree. Attached, we see what look like Omakuji. Oh, oh my little gosh, Chippy, hello! It's so good to that... see you! Welcome in! Oh my goodness! Thank you so much for the raid! I really appreciate that! Oh, you're playing Tori 3D! Oh, nice! I hope you enjoy playing Tori. That game is, is fun. <laughs> yeah, welcome in, y'all! Uh, welcome to our movie night! We're uh, watching some Sekiro lore videos after I beat the game last week. Uh, so we're just, you know, Vibing along and watching some Vati Vidya. 
But yeah, thank you so much for the raid, Spyro. It's really good to see you. Thanks so much. All right, let's keep on it. Written on paper by the occupants of the castle. And did you ever wonder how certain shinobi doors work? Most of them make sense, simply taking you from one room to the next, but some of them make as much sense as traveling in Dark Souls 2 from the Earthen Peak Into to the volcano. Iron Keep yep. after taking an elevator. That is to say, it makes no sense to flip a door in Ashina Castle and end up in the dilapidated temple, nor to flip the door in Headless's cave and end up deep within the mountains of Senpo Temple. However, From has put one tiny little detail here to deter any naysayers. There are nine unintelligible ancient Japanese symbols on the ground in both of these places, which we can only surmise to be magic markings controlling these shinobi doors, allowing us to teleport from one place to another. And as you all know, if it's magic, it ain't gotta explain shit. That's true. No right questions asked. Right some of the smallest, most impressive details often lie the most egregious mistakes that no lore master wants to bother trying to explain. For example, the so-called secret path out of Ashina doesn't really deliver, considering it's just an open field with a broken bridge going nowhere. I'm not exactly sure why Sekiro and Kuro keep coming back here. However, in this very same area, we also see some of the best hidden details that this game has to offer. In our first fight with Genichiro, Wolf is fighting after having experienced a complete defeat, having only recently lost his will to live. Mm -hmm. Thus, he's completely out of practice, and his skills here are really rusty, and it's shown visually in this cutscene, actually. Look at how Sekiro actually fumbles for his sword. Oh, wow, what a cool detail. Huh. Compare this to the Sekiro who fights at the end of the game. Look how smoothly he pulls out his sword and prepares That's for That's a really neat detail. Not only that, to grab his own sword. this wisp huh. of grass here actually represents Kuro, who has just fallen to the ground behind him. It's Baby. something that Sekiro doesn't even notice. That's how focused he is on the looming fight with Genichiro. Moving from Ashina into the depths, we encounter our first Shishimen warrior, which in Japanese means the warrior with seven faces. His design lives up to that as he has a ton of faces all over his armor and attacks with spirit heads that inflict terror. This warrior in particular drops the ceremonial Tanto, which is a dagger that was used in ritual offerings to the divine dragon. They would cut oh, spirit no, I did emblems one, from I their have own the flesh, and I use that as we know, the spirit fight. emblems harbor the souls of the dead. Considering this warrior harbors many lost souls himself, it's an item and a task that really suits this warrior. Curiously, the armor also features reared up centipedes on the shoulder guards. Sure does. The centipedes are representative of the depraved immortality of the fountainhead waters, so it does make some sense that these warriors who once made blood offerings to those waters would seek to adorn their armor with their likeness. In fact, most characters with centipedes can trace their immortality to the fountainhead waters. Take the guardian ape, for example, who in addition to lurking in a location where the fountainhead waters pool deeply, oh. also soothes its severed head wound in a small waterfall of flowing oh, that's what it's these doing. same fountainhead waters. It's curious and about that. as the that. centipede erupts from the ape's body, take special note of the way that the ape's movement changes. Originally, it fights like a beast as its mm -hmm. original self, but in the second phase, the centipede actually takes control, and now it fights with writhing, centipede-like winding attacks. Furthermore, it learns how to use a weapon, which raises even more questions about the centipedes and <laughs> yeah, just how intelligent true. they really are. The ape's waters are fountainhead waters, which is a fact that's proven once you succeed at killing the great carp with Harunaga's poisonous bait during the Pot Noble questline. Once I... it's fed, return here Killed and the carp. you'll find its corpse. Oh! Proof that somehow a corpse, even as large as this one, can end up here. Speaking of the depths, I would- Yeah, I didn't- I just- I avoided the carp, and then I fed him some scales, well, just one scale, until I was told, come back later, he'll get fat. But I got so wrapped up in the game that I didn't think to come back to the carp and, and like, feed him again. I didn't know that you would, like, eventually poison and kill the carp. I guess in a way that's probably a good thing, seeing as it's just a person- suffering from immortality <laughs> but damn 
there's a lot of branching like stuff in this game that I didn't even, like consider after like I got so wrapped up in the ending and finishing the game. But I recall Japanese culture seeing centipedes as a symbol of evil. Yeah, I mean, look at them. I also think that way about centipedes. I've always found this piece of dialogue strange, where the old woman asks whether you'll be cast out or throw yourself in. And as I was scanning through all the dialogue text that was data mined for the game, I actually discovered this cut line from Kuro. It reads, there exists a great gorge into which mortals are cast away into the underworld. Oh. Obviously, he's talking about the Ashina Depths, and we do find many undying down here, some of them victims of experiments with the rejuvenating waters. Speaking of cut content down here, originally there was a different item you gave to the Red Priest of Mibu Village. Instead of Dragon Spring Sake, it was supposed to be a fresh Innsmouth liver. And this is significant, because the town of Innsmouth is the setting for H.P. Lovecraft's well, I just saw Shadow that Over Innsmouth. That Bloodborne? And in this sniff, sniff, is Bloodborne? This Innsmouth. Anybody? Rest by the door saying Gulp in Sicker was once a varied reference to both Bloodborne, Fresh Livers, and H.P. Lovecraft's Innsmouth, as you see in these unused placeholder dialogues. Oh. Hell liver. yeah. And this is fucking love Bloodborne. Because the town of Innsmouth is the setting for H.P. Lovecraft's Shadow Over Innsmouth. And in this story, members of the village are turning into horrific aquatic life forms, which not only bears a ton of similarity to events in Mibu, but this is the story that inspired the fishing hamlet in yeah. Bloodborne. And there exists even more overlap with Bloodborne's fishing village. Slugs, for example, are a part of the story and environment in Mibu, just as they're a huge part of Bloodborne's fishing hamlet. <laughs> the basket head also mentions a hunter named Inuhiko, an outcast who eats the flesh of beasts and who uses fire to ward There's away a, other a, villagers. A beast eater in just Bloodborne. Like the hunters do in Bloodborne. Altier, yeah. I think it's less of an Easter egg and more of yet another example of From Software having common elements across all their games, oh, not to mention the vermin in Bloodborne, which have their own counterparts in Sekido's centipedes. There's even a hanging man cradling something that looks like a humanity sprite here. Perhaps he was killed for holding onto his humanity, which is clearly something that the other villagers have abandoned. One oh, thing I love that it. we never really got to the bottom of was why Mibu Lake is filled with the upturned bodies of the villagers. The most logical reason is that they drowned this way due to their undying thirst. But a more satisfying explanation lies in the 1976 Japanese film The Inugamis, which features a murder victim who is found in a lake in this exact same upturned pose. Huh. And if I understand correctly, this is something that has been referenced in more Japanese media than just Sekido since then. And we have the sarcastic Canadian on Reddit to thank for catching this one. <laughs> Moving back up <laughs> to the that. mountains and valleys of Ashina, we look next to an item within Senpo Temple. It's a second bell, just like the one that takes us to the illusory halls. This one is found in the lower part of Senpo, in the room with the centipede long neck, and you have to wonder if this was ever meant to serve a purpose? An entry point to a future DLC, perhaps? One of the most interesting items in Sekiro. Uh, yeah, sorry, Vati. This video is three years old. Yeah, about that, um, about that DLC, uh, for Sekiro. Bad news, buddy. There is none. <laughs> Bad news. It's just Sekiro. <laughs> is the contact medicine, a consumable that allows the player to voluntarily inflict a weak poison upon themselves so that they can't be affected by stronger poisons. But its most interesting use actually pertains to the Mist Raven prosthetic. For once you've taken the poison, it allows you to dash at any time oh. since you're always taking damage. Oh, and if you look carefully that's so cool. at the contact medicine, you'll discover what's responsible for your affliction. Bees! The stemming from the powder crushed into tiny little bits are wings and abdomens of what can only be wasps or bees. Huh. Next is something incredibly cool, but also incredibly unknown. If you use the bestowal ninjutsu on the green lizards, then your blade becomes enhanced with poisonous properties. And the same goes for blood smoke. You conjure a green mist that will poison anything inside of it. The lizards are so easy to kill that no one ever thinks to waste ninjutsu on them. Fair. But 
these effects are incredible. And honestly, it's actually a huge shame that these lizards are always placed in out of the way locations. Imagine if they were placed within boss fights, for example, and you could actually poison bosses by taking out a lizard. Or just like near a boss fight arena, I feel like that'd be cool. This ninjutsu could actually give you an edge in those fights. The same principle applies to the white lizards, of course, Don't. though the effect is way harder to figure out. After a ton of experimenting, I realized that bestowal actually imbues your blade with a lifesteal effect, and that the blood smoke can be used to conjure a health regenerating cloud. But oh, you'll never need so to heal neat. if you never take damage. And there's no way to take no damage more stylish than the Sempo Kick into High Monk. It actually <laughs> deals a really fantastic amount of posture damage if you use it as an anti-sweep attack, because it also gets the bonus for jumping onto an enemy. Oh, as well. you get the Just Goomba Stomp bonus. That's so big brained. Projectiles, as you'll take extra damage and get smacked out of the air. Sheesh. Of course, this principle applies to your enemies as well. Every time they're in the air, make sure you throw a shuriken, or you can even throw ceramic shards to knock enemies out of the air. Oh, this that's also very clever. I didn't think about that at all. One of the most underrated Neat. items in the whole game. Speaking of anti-air death blows, a surprising amount of enemies are susceptible to them. There's the twin blade enemies, the Okami, but most useful is actually against the Shishiman warrior. You may not have realized that you can use this here though, because it only becomes possible to do if you have Divine Confetti active mm -hmm. on your weapon. Confetti is also an item that's generally underrated, especially in the late game and new game plus, where you can purchase an infinite supply after getting the dragon's tally board. Yeah, I uh, I noticed this as well with the Divine Confetti. When I was like really desperate for like boss fight stuff, like how to beat a boss, I would look up like, you know, how other folks fought that boss, like videos. And I always notice people, people use a lot of Divine Confetti, like in the more uh, advanced like gameplay footage. So I guess there's like a lot to the confetti besides allowing you to like attack ghost enemies or like uh, terror based enemies, which is cool. I like the confetti a lot. Uh, one for the effect when you like uh, use it, it's pretty. But two, uh, the cool purple sword. <laughs> I like purple. From the corrupted monk. It's the best item to spend your sen on at that point. It really because is. Because Divine Confetti actually increases your weapon damage against all enemies, not just apparitions. Mm -hmm. This item allows you to connect with apparition type enemies because the paper is created using water from the fountainhead and it's blessed by the gods. And this got me thinking, well then how come you can damage the headless underwater without the confetti. Underwater? Then one answer might be that since they're underwater, oh, right, that in guy the same underwater. divine waters that created the divine confetti, they might naturally be vulnerable to it as a result. Okay, Moving that's on cool. Into the valley, you encounter this league of snipers who can take you out at they're an insane in, they're distance. Yeah, they are basically in, in holy water. Area, that's true, though. It's just the attention to detail. I, I skipped that that fight because I was so scared and folks on the on the fish. Um, you know, the big giant koi fish, um, or the carp, whatever. It's both. <laughs> um, but yeah, I noticed when I was attacking the headless without confetti, I was still doing pretty substantial damage to it. So that totally makes sense. It's literally swimming in, in holy water, basically. Now, even with the whipping winds, these snipers are still able to hit you. And the reason is these. These I think are called wind socks, which wind socks. allow you to tell which direction wind is blowing and how fast, all at a glance. This is an invaluable tool for the snipers of the Sunken Valley. And damn, those snipers sound pretty OP, right? Well, what if I told you that you could recruit one of them for your own? I found this idea on YouTube, and it's pretty genius. Oh, the, you just use uh, Puppeteer yeah, on puppeteer the snake eyes right outside the Guardian Ape fog gate, and you can actually bring her in with you as ranged support during what? this difficult during the 2v2 ape fight? fight. Oh my just god. Just make sure you reapply the effect throughout the fight, and the fight against the two apes actually ends up being much Sniper more fair. Assistant. Something That's people neat. rarely do is kill the Guardian Ape before you kill the Guardian Ape's low health mate. If you do this, then you actually don't need to even kill the mate. She just gets sad and leaves Aww. instead. This <laughs> next theory was put forward by a Japanese blogger. There's a translated link in the description. It puts forward that 
Years ago, Ashina might have been hit by a meteorite made of adamantite, which would explain the precious metal scraps that Ashina is known for, as well as this deep lake that's right in the middle of the fountainhead. To add to this, I would put forward that lazulite, the rare metal of Fountainhead Palace, also would have come from this meteorite as well, because the last line of the lazulite shuriken actually reads, the lazulite blue trail of light it emits in flight is reminiscent of a shooting star. This meteor would explain a few things. It would explain why the metals of the Ashina are so special, so special that they attracted the attention of the gods. It would explain the supernatural powers of the divine waters, and perhaps most importantly, it would explain why the Mibu breathing technique was required to meet the divine dragon. The path to the palace is underwater, after all, but it can't have always been this way. The crater must have filled with water after the arrival wow, of the divine really, dragon. Wow, uh, that's really neat. Like right before stuff. meeting the divine dragon, we find what is surely a Miko. A sort of female shaman or shrine maiden. And if my research is correct, then their role was one of spirit possession and cleansing. And she may have even served as a means of communication with the divine, allowing the dragon to possess and speak through her. You can make a very strong case for both mortal blades originating from the divine realm. The Open Gate, or Black Mortal Blade, has a description that asks the user to make offerings to the dragon's blood, and the Gracious Gift of Tears, or Red Mortal Blade, was surely intended for use on the Divine Dragon, because it gets its tears, though it's yeah, it impossible does. to know why it was created. If you look at the box it comes from, actually, you can even see the same crest commonly found in Fountainhead Palace. Furthermore, the Red Mortal Blade was taken and hidden by the Sempo High Priest, the man who founded Sempo Temple, meaning that the man himself surely once traveled to this palace. A fact oh, he's got, that like, makes sense he's when like covered you look at the similarity in Icky. architecture oh, cool. between these two places. That's what I love about From Software's games. Their world building is just so consistent. That's what I'm saying, the world building is so compared. good! While exploring the Fountainhead, it's easy to become enfeebled, likely leading to a quick death as you can't even resurrect in this state. However, you can still fight back, barely. And if you manage to inflict a death blow upon an opponent, you actually undergo a unique kill animation in your weakened state. While recording this death blow, I managed to get a closer look at one Ew. of the crests on the palace noble scarves. It's a picture of the vermilion bird, something that's mentioned a couple more times in game, uh, nearby is the Vermilion Bridge, where you fight the Corrupted Monk, and it's also emblazoned upon Suzaku's Lotus Umbrella, oh. which protects you from flame. But what exactly is the Vermilion Bird? Is it a Well, phoenix? put simply, it's basically the eastern version of the Phoenix. Yeah! It's a red pheasant that is perpetually covered in flame, a mythological spirit creature of the Chinese constellations. Another cultural reference nearby is the mask that's worn by the corrupted monk. Specifically, this is actually called a Hanya mask, something that's used to represent a jealous female demon in Japanese no theatre. It has a wonderful design, because when you look at it straight on, it's meant to look frightening and angry, but when you look at it from an above angle, the face is sorrowful, and it's a design that's intended to convey the complexities of human emotion. Uh, Saku is also the most of the by things. Oh, that's so neat. How goes? Hey, welcome, Turtle. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed your nap. But yeah, we're still watching some uh, some really cool uh, lore videos about Sekiro. Um, we're learning a lot of really neat stuff, and I love this in particular. I've always adored the monk's design. First off, for the mask being so cool, but two, just her design is oh, chef's kiss. Another cultural reference is the Great Carp, which could pertain to the Chinese legend of the Dragon's Gate. Me too, Para. I the love story the story goes, a lot. many carp swim upstream in the river's current, but very few are brave enough to make that final leap over the waterfall to the Dragon's Gate. If a carp successfully makes them. the jump, it can transform into a powerful dragon. And considering the Divine Dragon is actually called the Ningyo Dragon in Ningyo. cut content, and the word Ningyo describes a sort of carp, we can put stock in this legend as it relates to the Divine Dragon. And speaking of the carp, 
Did you know that it's possible to make it friendly? <gasps> if you feed him Koremori's truly precious bait, then he'll no longer attack you in the underwater Friend. stealth section. Another oh. beast in the Fountainhead Palace is the Sakura Bull. That's what I missed. Roaming the back of the area. Since this, this isn't actually a boss fight like the other bull fight. Okay, but can we look at this cool design though for a second? Look at this design. Sheesh. See, I, I had heard like a, a beast roar in Fountainhead, but I couldn't find out how to get into it, like in that area. But man, that's a really neat design. I like the uh the tree branch with the purple on it. Like looking like Sakura leaves. Oh, that's the other sick. Bull fight. You can use the firecracker from stealth here, which scares the bull to death. Oh. Literally. <laughs> While all this is going on below, I also want to point out that the Okami on the rooftops are just chilling and chillin'. enjoying their sake. Anyway, back to the bull. Scaring it completely breaks the bull's posture, something that can never happen to you as long as you deflect the attack. Sure, your posture bar can fill, even when you deflect perfectly, mm -hmm. some attacks are just too powerful. But as long as you deflect them, nothing will ever actually break your posture meter, a fact that is particularly important in New Game Plus. And that's something I've never actually mentioned on the channel. New Game Plus brings with it the option to give back Kuro's Charm, an item that he slips onto your person at the start of the game. Without it, you actually take about 30% chip damage whenever you block against attacks. Oh. So playing in this way requires you to deflect perfectly if you want to get oh. by. Another item you might have taken for granted is the hidden tooth or the bite down drug. Yep. Both of which grant you death. Never used it. However, it's not a regular sort of death. Usually when you die, your resurrections are afflicted by a black strike through, which prevents you from resurrecting for a time. However, if you commit Sudoku with this item, Sudoku? you actually get no such black strike, meaning that a player who accepts their death with a little bit of foresight can actually squeeze out more resurrections, especially if you have extra See. resurrections granted by the Sakura Droplet that drops from Lady Butterfly. Speaking of death, it was originally planned that NPCs with Dragon Rot could die, a mechanic oh. that thankfully that never horrible. made it into the game. <laughs> This was discovered, again, by Lance McDonald, whose video on the topic you can find in the description. And I'm sorry, but he like, talks about how they used could to- Could you imagine a mechanic where if you fuck up so bad in the video game, the NPCs just die? <laughs> it's, uh, that's very funny, but extremely rough to think about. And welcome in reality. <laughs> As days now, my mother, my mother was in Japan many years ago. It was a hotel that was built on a mountain near the water. They had to build a hole through the hotel so the dragon spirit lived in the hubbuns could go between the mountain home and the water. Oh, I love that. It True, it would force you to care about the rot more than what you do in the game. Like, I, I ended up caring enough where I would constantly try to go cure a rot, but for the first like half of Sekiro, I would just like, dragon rot, weird, anyway, keeps dying. <laughs> But the idea that they were going to make it so that people would just totally die, oof. To be an item called Dragon Rot Pellets, which you could create via Emma by Emma. trading in some of your resurrective power. Giving these pellets to a sick NPC would heal them, but just imagine how tedious this would have been. Yes. Compared to that would have been the pure extremely item tedious. we have in the dragon's blood droplet. Another great asset to the community is named Illusory Wall, who always discovers really neat things about these games. Long ago, he discovered that if you spam buttons while you're grabbed, you'll take significantly less damage. That's an Every One Souls more mechanic game. that did make it into the Every game. Every Souls game has that. that. Not many know about is. If you don't know that already, it's very common now, but. Uh, if you mash buttons during most grab attacks in like any Souls game, you're taking less damage. So, fun fact, if you didn't know that already. If you're if you're being grabbed in any Souls game, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, Elden Ring, mash uh I think it's L1 and R1, and you'll be you'll take less damage. <laughs> a method by which you increase your stealth when you fall from a high place. Crouch as soon as you hit the ground and You'll be able to better stealth past enemies like this one, yeah, even always from above. Mash, always. Speaking of above, the award for the highest kill goes to Evil Plan Z on Reddit, who says, "Fuck this monkey in particular." <laughs> I love that. My final fact: 
pertains to the Sekiro Design Works, Ooh, which is this book that. of gorgeous art also, that you can pick up pretty easily online from sites like Yes Asia and Amazon. Links are in the description. Go check it out. It's an amazing collector's item, but there aren't too many revelations in here compared to previous design works. Um, except for one interesting piece of what must be cut content, which depicts what appears to be Emma. Her <gasps> eyes are bound wow. and her hair is graying in the same manner that ours, Kuro, and the Okamis are. Pretty. Thank you, as always, for watching. Mokumin Blue. Back in March, when Sekiro released, follow. I first promoted. That, I'm sorry, that I, I know it's like sad, like it's sad art, but she looks beautiful. In that piece in where she has the blindfold and stuff. I mean, that's, yeah, that's sad, but oh, that long hair is so pretty on her. All right, time to do for the Prepare to Cry series. This is a six minute video about Robert and the Armored Knight. For the sake of my son. Oh boy. Put down your sword. I will not. I will not. You are a fool. You are a fool. In 15. Going to store. Oh, give me some hot fries. Min, it's good to see you. I'll give you a shout out. Uh, boop. Min, I know you probably know about this already because I have not stopped talking about it, but Min, did, did you know that tomorrow, uh, Leg's playing Outer Wilds and I'm going to be there? I, you, you gotta show up. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> I'm so excited. We're both making Outer Wilds PNGs. I can't wait. I just had the Vati Sekiro merch. I bet it's really good. I didn't even think about looking at his merch. I'm kind of curious. Oh, PNG? Yeah, it's, it's a type. This is cool. Oh. I got sidetracked looking at Vati merch. Can't tell. Oh, I'm so, so, so stoked. Oh, they have the Seekers merch. I love that. I'm in the, uh, the Seekers group on Elden Ring. Cool stuff. Uh, actually, speaking of merch, um, I actually found that I have a Sekiro print in my house I did not know about until last week. So I bought for my house, when I bought my house, I bought three prints to hang up in my living room. I bought a two Bloodborne prints and a Dark Souls print. And when I bought those prints, they came with like extra goodies, like stickers and stuff. And with it came a really nice picture of Ishin, but I didn't know who that was back then. And I found it in my drawer. I was like, oh my God, I have Sekiro merch, <laughs> like Sekiro art in my house. I'm gonna hang it up in my room when I think about in it next. In 43, three Portuguese traders reached Japan. The anyway, first let's Europeans start over because this is a cool one foot. about the armored knight and Robert. For the sake of my son, put down your sword. I will not. You are a fool. In 1543, three Portuguese traders reached Japan, the first Europeans to ever set foot on its shore. They were, of course, from the west, but since they arrived at the southern port from across southern seas, they were regarded as southern barbarians. In their wares were silk, porcelain, but most importantly, Portuguese guns. For Japan was in the midst of a brutal civil war, and a weapon like this could turn the tide. So Japanese smiths quickly reverse engineered the weaponry, and renewed warfare swept throughout the country. In response, many smiths started to acquire and experiment with European plate as well. As a result, samurai armor became stiffer but bullet resistant, a compromise with western plate, which was impenetrable but cumbersome. <laughs> Your sword cannot pierce my armor. Why do you not understand? The Armored Knight and his son, Robert, likely stepped ashore during this turbulent time, making a name for themselves by selling bright red firecrackers. Their deafening sound could be used to terrify beasts and unseat horsemen, which was a popular tool that Robert and his father quickly turned into local currency. However, the money that they raised was not their goal. It was simply a means to an end. For the knight's son, Robert, was very sick, oh. and his father needed to raise funds for their travels. Across the sea, he'd heard tales of the Undying in the mountains, and as soon as he sold off their wares, they headed for Mount Congo. Whatever the sickness was that his son had, it was clearly worth risking everything for. 
as they were traveling deep into warring states territory, and they would be lucky to survive. Strike me all you like. I am unbreakable. Monkey. My son will receive the waters. What he found must have been beyond his wildest imagination. Sempo Temple, a powerful institution of warrior monks who would have just begun to close their doors to the outside around this time. They believed they could attain eternal life by experimenting with the legendary waters that flowed through the lands of the Ashina. This legend is so similar to that of the Fountain of Youth, mm -hmm. something that the Armored Knight no doubt believed could restore Robert to good health. Those of the Senpo Temple have strayed from Buddha's teachings. They have abandoned their faith, seduced by a search for immortality. To the monks, however, such a search for immortality lay perfectly in line with their own beliefs. The ultimate goal of the Buddha, after all, is liberation from samsara, the cycle of rebirth. And if these men could achieve eternal life, then they too may achieve enlightenment just like the Buddha once did. And the secret, they believed, lay in the birth of a divine child. So they cut ties with the Ashina, shut their doors, and set to work. The gates to that temple are closed now, though. Who knows what those degenerates are doing shut away up there in the mountains. First, they needed children. Hundreds of oh. children. Children who would be sacrificed for the monks' greater oh. good. This, of course, would bring incredible negative karma in the next life. But what threat could negative karma pose to the undying? So they grimly pressed ahead, sacrificing children, but also laying tributes for their departed souls. Oh. Small statues, mebu balloons, and pinwheels that blow gently in the wind. Oh. The spinning, spinning red and white flowers. Only one pure white flower. The pure white flower I cannot find. When the Armored Knight arrived, the monks probably couldn't believe their luck. Here was a man, not only willing to put his child into their care, but he was also willing to defend their home. He was a foreigner too, one who likely wouldn't guess at the meaning of the little statues and pinwheels before the bridge. Oh. So they oh, no. likely offered him a deal. Oh, Repel no. a thousand blades, and we will grant your child the blessing of rejuvenation. Of course, the monks probably did try to grant the blessing of rejuvenation. They might not have lied to him completely, but it is unlikely that the armored knight ever knew the true meaning of the little statues, of the pinwheels as well. Nor is it likely that he discovered the bound bodies hurled off the cliff behind him. He would never have a chance to, for he would go on to join them. Oh. Not at the hands of the monks, but by the boot of a shinobi who needed to pass. Robert! He died thinking he'd failed his son. But what he would never know was that a child of the rejuvenating waters had been successfully created long ago. And it could not have been Robert. For of all the pinwheels, there is only one pure white flower. The divine child of the rejuvenating waters. That's fucked up. If you watched this video the week that it came out, then the next episode is actually already out, and you can watch it right now. It's just over on Patreon. I have a bunch of reward tiers over there. Fucking but I how dare you, Zoli, or fucking Vati, that hurt. Also, make you need to grab my phone charger. Give me a sec. Let me quickly sit up and grab that. Yeah, that got me teary-eyed, too. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know what the Japanese voice actor sounds like, but um, the English VA really went, really went in with that one. 
what happened? Oh, we're watching um the sad part of dark of Sekiro lore. That one hurt. Next. <laughs> one of the very few things the Interior Ministry fears is Ashina, her eyes bloodshot with the waters of rejuvenation. Ashina owes a lot to these pure waters, which have emboldened her soldiers over the years. Some, like the Tarot Troop, are practically raised on the persimmons that grow in them, which nourish them to monstrous proportions. Others, like Genichiro, imbibe the concentrated sediment, risking their humanity for the way of the Ashina, victory at any cost. And a few, lurking in deep caves and distant forests, do just the opposite. They risk the lives of others for the sake of the self. Begin preparations. Yes, sir. Preparing the rejuvenating water. This man, Dojun, and his split personality, Dosaku, are almost certainly allied with Genichiro, as they're experimenting with the waters of rejuvenation in order to push the human body further. This, they believe, is the only way to repel the might of the interior ministry, and it's possible, no, it's easy to recruit one such Taru Troop member for these experiments, because they're trusting, easily led, and also distracted by some mental anguish. Our subject is of large stature and possesses near superhuman strength. This inspires confidence for the glory of Ashina. This man bestie. is, or was, named Kotaro. Kotaro! <laughs> it's not human. Not anymore. In the adjacent cell lies another one of Dojin's prisoners, and before his death he managed to scrawl a note about his adventures, which reads, Supposedly the fragrant stone is enshrined in a village in the Ashina Depths, Welcome in, Carl. but how do I interpret throw oneself? This is as far as that old Okami tome could take me, but did they truly reach the Fountainhead Palace? I'd like to know, but it seems I never will. This adventurer was following the Okami on their path to the Fountainhead, mm -hmm. like we are, but this is where his journey ended. What's tragic, however, is how he signs off. It reads, Forgive me, Kotaro. Thus, the former Tarot Troop member who was transformed here is his son, who was foolishly led to this place because he knows it's where his father went. Tragically, the journey of the father dooms the son. But it doesn't have to be this way. There is another path, and it starts with Kotaro being taken to become a monk. To be taken is sort of like being spirited away. It's a supposedly supernatural occurrence, and when it happens to you, you're supposed to go to the temple Many choose to become the a sad game. See, the thing the about like uh, taken... games like Sekiro and Dark Souls and Bloodborne is like if you just play the base game and, and just like play it and don't really pay too much to the lore, I think they're all sad in their respective ways. It's more of like when you really dive into beneath the surface and really get to learn about the characters and the bosses and the history of the game. I think they're all pretty sad. Um, yeah, I think so. But I don't think anybody would go out of the way and be like, oh, you should play Dark Souls. It's super sad. Like, yeah, it is. But on the surface, it's just like, you know, action-y, adventuring kind of role play RPG game, you know. A second time. It just depends on how you look real, at it. And you might just disappear. Yeah, like very somber. It's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> They left me here. Where did everyone go? Why did you leave Kotaro behind? Now what do I do? <laughs> they left me all alone, and I have to find the pure white flower. The pure white flower flew away. Where could it be? When a child loses their life in service to the monk's experiments, a flower or pinwheel is planted. Unfortunately, Kotaro doesn't recall this, as he suffers from the same sort of head trauma that the rest of the Tarot Troop do. But bring the one white pinwheel to Kotaro, and he'll remember the truth. Is this the pure white flower? Oh, 
Ah, that's... I remember now. Everyone. They are children of the rejuvenating waters. And I remember I tried to find a pure white pinwheel. A pinwheel for that child. The child of whom he speaks is the one who received the rejuvenating waters successfully. It awoke a sort of divinity in her, an artificial form of the dragon's heritage, something that Kuro has too. I am one of the children of the rejuvenating waters, created by those who would stop at nothing to achieve immortality. My false dragon's blood was created by man. Children? So there are many of you. I am the only one who survived the process. The others are laid to rest here. I see. Thankfully, the success of the experiment moved her to a realm beyond that of the monks, and now she serves them Hi no there. longer. Hey, can I ask a favor? What? Could you spirit me away? I don't follow. I know about you. You're a shinobi, right? Those monks say shinobi can spirit people away, make them disappear as if they were never there. Why do you want that? Well, I'm sure that everyone will be wherever I disappear to. Aww. And then I'll get to see them. Aww. I'm in charge of looking after the children, after all. Oh. You can do that, right? All right. No. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm ready, but also a little frightened. Oh. But yes, do it. Oh, no. Kotaro? Hmm? Oh, it's you! Well, I'm glad you made it! Uh, look, everyone! Mr. Shinobi is here, too! Ah, uh, children, greet him properly! <sighs> hmm? All oh, right. Uh, you can't see them, can you? The rejuvenated children? Yes! You can't see them, but they're there! They're adorable kids! Right then, I must give you my thanks. Take this! Thank you so, so much! <laughs> what is it? <laughs> the kids are saying thank you too! They're so adorable! And so, Kotaro joins the rejuvenating children and the Divine Child in their lonely realm. A place that the Divine Child is finally thinking of leaving. I don't want to lose them, but if I were to choose the path of returning the dragon's heritage, it may come to pass that I would have to leave all of you. But with Kotaro here to take care of the children, it should be easier for the divine child to finally leave her friends. For in the end, she leaves to become a cradle for Lord Kuro, embarking with us on a dangerous journey to the west, our next adventure to return the dragon's heritage. If you watch this video the week that it came out, Bruh. then the next episode is actually- Oh, it's Haru, my beloved little guy. I didn't know he was in charge of taking care of all the children. Oh my god, this game is so sad. Yeah, I don't know if he can like actually see them, but I mean, she talks about seeing them as well, so it must be something about them that allows them to see the children uh, who have passed on. That's fucked up. <laughs> I would assume so. If I mean, Robert obviously isn't the divine child, so that means Kataro is with Robert, or should be. So at least there's that happiness. No, I think, no, I don't think so. I think the, the monk is a different character altogether. <laughs> but I didn't finish her storyline. I just gave, she got my sword and I was like, oh, thank you. I'll take this now. Um, we're gonna skip Ishin's story because again, I have not like done all the endings. So I would like to, uh, you know, wait on that one until I beat the game again and do all that I can with his character. Go sad, yeah, go sad. Uh, something has to do with knowing the children like that love to see him. Yeah, I think so as well. Like if he was the caretaker of all the kids who were sacrificed, oof. <laughs> Feed my my coins, Mr. Freeman. Monks of Semper Temple. Next one Monks is of Semper Temple this one. kidnapped hundreds of children, 
all in the name of immortality. But what use is eternity if you have to spend it with your sins? Children of the rejuvenating waters, I should know. forgive me that child. She's the only one left. Responsible for their kidnap were an order of Sempo assassins. Deadly and short in stature, they would have easily been able- These things are what kidnap the kids. I already hated these things. Now I hate them more. <laughs> I have more reason to hate these little dudes. To sneak into homes and steal Welcome people's Kaya. young ones. A leader among them was Black Hat Badger, who is a noteworthy character if for no other reason than he has an animal tag attached to his name. Yeah. Among the Sempo assassins, however, his notable title was that of Black Hat, which was a distinction that was given to the wielder of the Iron Fortress, a headpiece that was passed down through generations of assassins serving Senpo Temple. However, in this era, it's especially common for allegiances to change. Black Hat is fighting like a demon by the Serpent Valley side of the castle. Then that's where we're going next, but keep your wits about you. The Black Hat Badger won't go down without a fight. <sighs> Told those morons to give it a rest, but they don't. They just keep sending more. Such a pain in my head, huh? <laughs> you one of them Nightjar cronies? No. Ah, of course not. There's something different. Yes, you can do you. your daily fan I... cam. I'll I'll uh, I'll wait for it. I don't, I don't mind waiting. So if you wanna do your so there we go, there it is. Precious when you smile. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There's your fan cam. Say you're in the same line of work. The name's Black Hat Badger. <laughs> What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> Real sociable one, aren't we? First this stubborn lot, now a down in the dumb shinobi. Could this day get any better? You're Jeez. a fugitive. Something like that, sure. Black Hat is on the run, pursued by the best assassins of Senpo Temple, but also the Nightjar, personal assassins of the Ashina elite. These two factions have experienced renewed relations under Genichiro, since Genichiro both. has a keen interest in the monk's experiments with the waters of rejuvenation. Thinking I may be leaving soon. Where to? Senpo Temple up on Mount Kongo. There's all sorts of rats around here these days. Got a feeling things are gonna get real ugly real soon. Hey, you. So, it's about time I tied up some loose ends. Take care of yourself, you hear? From the top of Ashina Castle to its very depths, you'll find spies of the Interior Ministry. Rats probing the country for weaknesses, mm -hmm. but perhaps it's even more common that you stumbled upon their corpses cut up by the Tengu. Rats have been swarming into Ashina Castle these days. You know the ones I mean. But there's this hell-bent old-timer cutting them up like it was nothing. <laughs> Black Hat knows the Tengu is Ishin, as he does reveal it to you later, before the end. He has a grudging respect for the man who fights honestly for his country. But even with the Tengu's efforts, the rats keep swarming in. The ministry is coming, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop that. The best you can do is tie up loose ends and get out while you still can. Well, well, if it isn't all chuckles. Did you take care of your business? That I did. All thanks to you. Whose grave is this? This, it's a, uh, it belongs to my kid. I see. After the little runt passed away, all the grunt work I used to do just didn't cut it. Experiments with rejuvenation, kidnapping, responsibilities of a black hat, everything to do with this temple was just rubbing me the wrong way. So that's why you quit. <sighs> that's right. Well, that takes care of my business here. I owe you one. Oh. By the way, you probably figured already, but Ashina, you know, she reeks of charred corpses and gunpowder, something fierce. The rats are flooding in like you wouldn't believe. Hmm. You watch yourself out there. When it finally came time to set fire to Ashina's walls, the interior ministry was ready. The one weakness of Ashina's red-eyed monsters, which the interior ministry fear, is fire. 
And so the ministry designed weapons that specifically exploit that weakness. Additionally, a special dousing powder was created, something that would prevent the ministry's own soldiers from succumbing to burns. As a final insult, among their forces too appear to be Senpo assassins, garbed in red now, betrayers of Senpo, just as they were betrayers of Black Hat. <laughs> Badger. Look who it is. I couldn't take it. Too many rats swarming in out of the woodwork. Ishin must have terrified him. That's why I'd gone and done something a little out of character. What happened? Those mangy rats. They were closing in on a little kid. <laughs> so, so I saved him. Oh. And now look at me. Guess the great Black Hat Badger story ends here. <laughs> I gotta thank you. Take what you want. When I'm gone. <laughs> I would give it to you now, but... It's Oof. a Meibu balloon, made in the year of the Dragon Spring pilgrimage, and sealed with a prayer for a healthy upbringing. Oh. On it is written, to Tenkichi from Badger. A gift to his son that he just wanted to hold on to a little bit longer. Hopefully, the act of sacrificing himself to save a small child in some small way righted his bad karma. If you watched this video the week that it came out, then the next episode is actually already out. Man. And you can watch Man. it right now. It's just over on Patreon. Uh, and... Every story is sad in Sekiro. Holy shit. Oh, my heart is in pieces. Pieces! Ahim him. Whimper. Again, the big says, Me too! How do you think I feel? How do you think I feel? Second like a tragedy. Every character. Oh. Every character's got some shit. Yeah, it's a FromSoft game. Of course it's sad. The giant baby man. Yeah, that giant baby man was sad too. We just watched that one. <laughs> Every character, like, we just watched uh, Robert and Armored Knight. We watched The Children of Senpu, which goes into uh, his story as well. Too sad. Going to cry now. Sniff, sniff. Sniff, sniff. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was a good one. I like that one a lot. Um. Uh, from either a sad, tragic, and dark, or mecha. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Almost on brand, right? There's have to have some sort of sad stories. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a lot of the overarching themes. I mean, any of the, a lot of the stories that you can get into in any of the Souls games, uh, Bloodborne and Sekiro, uh, all have these characters with very, very sad, uh, upbringings or, like, backgrounds. It's all written into- I mean, yeah, this is- this video that it was really sad is about a merchant that you can actually just miss entirely in the game. Black Hat Badger is a merchant that to find him, you have to go jump around a little bit and find a hole in a roof. Like, completely skippable and missable character has this beautiful story about a man who lost his son and, like, lost his, uh, fight for anything. And then dies trying to right a wrong and protect a child. It's just like, what, dude? So I like a design. Oh, um, the design. I actually drew this blanket myself. Uh, it is the design of the Twitch team I'm in called the Wrecking Crew. So yeah. It's our little team blanket that I drew for everybody in the team to use when they want to be comfy. Um, but that's actually all the, the secular videos that I've have besides these ones we actually miss this on your way to retrieve the lotus of the palace this is the old gods of the sunken valley video on your way to retrieve the lotus of the palace you journey through the sunken valley a place that's inaccessible to most in it coils a white serpent an old god of the land it's worshipped by the sunken valley clan a forlorn people who man the gun fort Deeper still, you'll find the valley where the monkeys dwell, where the sculptor once trained to become a shinobi. 
He trained with a partner here named Kingfisher, a woman who would go on to be consumed by an undying ape. The lore runs deep here. Let's talk about it. This is the Great Serpent, a god of the land, or so the Sunken Valley clan believe. They don't just worship the snake, rather they worship the heart, for the heart is believed to be where one's spirit resides. They enshrine the organs, believing that they represent the deity itself. And with two hearts, you can initiate the Dragon's Return ending, an ending that has the divine child of the rejuvenating waters become a cradle for the dragon's blood, which allows the Sakura Dragon to leave Japan. For when the Sakura Dragon came from the west and took root in Ashina, many lesser gods left, and the Serpent God was almost certainly one of them. Look ahead to Mibu Village for proof. Oh. Here, we find scraps of snake skin caught upon rooftops and dangling from the gates. And it may not have just been the serpent god that left this place. Buddha, too, has been desecrated here as a result of the Sakura dragon. Furthermore, just as snake statues are found all throughout Senpo Temple, so too are Buddhist statues found within the Sunken Valley, home of the serpent god. These statues seem like they were intended to hold the two hearts of the great serpents. The first statue is cradling a snake skin, which likely belonged to the full-grown snake just beyond. The second heart, however, lies in a cave. You there, don't go into that cave up ahead. Inside is an old shrine where the Serpent God dwells. And if the Serpent God swallows you, you can't buy any more offerings now, oh. can you? Yeah, I didn't do this part. This I couldn't get past it. This dried heart might have belonged to an older serpent, a spirit that was passed from Buddha's hands to ours so that we can pursue the dragon's return. Food for thought. Ooh. So those are the Serpent God's hearts. But what about its eyes? The snake eyes are the commanders of the Sunken Valley clan. Female fighters equipped with flint cannons and blessed with phenomenal vision. As the eyes of the snake, they've positioned themselves at both entrances to the Sunken Valley, striking fear into any stranger who approaches. Yeah, this thing's... And this not only suck. do they watch out for the snake, those of the Sunken Valley also offer themselves to it in marriage. Well, marriage in quotation marks, because it really means to make an offering of oneself, such as their devotion to the serpent god. Uh, but when they're not feeding themselves to a snake, it's likely that the Sunken Valley clan is busy mining the precious metals of the valley. Magnetic deposits are found all over the valley, and their value is evident, for the Sunken Valley clan ended up concocting medicines to help them resist the toxic state of this place. And while it's said that those who stay here long enough can overcome their weakness to poison, two prominent women here are still devastated by it. These are the Snake Eyes, commanders of the clan, and they are no match for Sabimaru, your poisonous prosthetic Kodachi blade. <laughs> and there's a reason for this. For the blade reads, That's Sabimaru funny. was wielded Phenomenal in vision. wars of old. Yet they're blindfolded. Treasure I thought I was the only it one with super sight. to drive or not. the inhuman Okami warrior women, and even now, it is likely to be effective against their descendants. The Snake Eyes are descendants of the ancient Okami clan. Oh. Okami means dragon, and it's likely referring to the clan of carp-like beings that you find in Fountainhead Palace. Because long, long ago, in the most ancient days of the Ashina, this Okami clan gathered the Fountainhead fragrance and arrived at the palace. They pledged themselves to the Sakura Serpent, making ceremonial blood offerings to it, which is an act that is not unlike what the Sunken Valley clan did. They too offer themselves in marriage to the Serpent God. The difference is, while one clan dances joyously in a divine realm, the other clan sits sullenly atop the frozen, poisonous cliff face of the Sunken Valley. Hmm. One incredibly neat detail is that the Okami women are master marksmen. They have this godlike accuracy with the bow, lightning bolt, and soccer ball. <laughs> Just soccer ball? so yeah. their descendants too can also hit their targets from half a league away. 
still using ranged weapons just like their ancestors, except now, ones that have been adapted for the modern age. There are some benefits to being left behind, it seems. And that's a point of contention, whether they were left behind or not. And it's something I found myself going back and forth on the entire time I've been scripting this. There are two options that I see, and the question is this. Was the Sunken Valley clan left behind when the rest of their clan ascended, staying loyal to the Serpent God, whereas the Okami went on to worship the Sakura Dragon? Or did the Okami ascend to the Divine Realm and then return, with some serpent-worshipping descendants going on to settle in the Sunken Valley? I think Valley. it's the first one. I think they and were left behind. Make no mistake, the Okami clan did eventually come back. That is a fact after mm -hmm. they ascended to the Divine Realm. They brought the thunder with them, invading Ashina and killing its people. The game calls this an old war. It's a long forgotten event, so it's no surprise that the details are scarce. We don't even know why they invaded, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. But what we do know is that the Okami were eventually repelled by Sabimaru, an heirloom forged by the Ashina. Yeah. This weapon held the poisonous gift of blue rust, which was kryptonite to the Okami warriors. The context like of this really, war changes yeah, I that too. It's dependent so on cool. whether you believe that the Sunken Valley clan was left behind. Uh, earlier we watched the, the folklore video about Sekiro, and it showed like just a few of the many callbacks to either uh, Japanese folklore or like real-life uh parts of Japanese history. It's so cool. I just, I'm obsessed. Behind when the Okami ascended, or whether you believe the Sunken Valley Clan came to exist after the Okami invaded and descended I think, I think from it's the Fountainhead. One. There's evidence for both ideas. I can't find one piece of evidence that makes it true beyond reason. So I'll tell you both stories and you can decide what to believe. So first, the Sunken Valley Clan may have come to exist as a result of the Okami's failed invasion. The Green Mossy Gourd says that it was made out of necessity by those that made poisonous lands their home. It said that if you live there long enough, eventually poison won't affect you at all. If the Okami were indeed bitter at being defeated by poison, then perhaps they wish to overcome this weakness over generations of exposure. <laughs> Just try to become built different. It's also fair Love to that. believe that the Sunken Valley clan was left behind by the Okami clan when they ascended to the Divine Realm. If this was the case, then they would have learned about their weakness to poison from living in the valley all this time, and they may have helped the Ashina forge Sabimaru when the Okami came back and invaded. Sabimaru was gifted with poisonous blue rust, after all, and there is evidence of an alliance between the Sunken Valley clan and Ashina. Many of the Sunken Valley manned the watchtowers of the Ashina, and they the sure key do. to their gunfort shrine is even kept in the private quarters of the Ashina elite. Together, the Ashina and the Sunken Valley clan may well have repelled the inhuman Okami. I like this theory more. I do too. The Ashina like called well. the Okami clan it's inhuman, a lot of sense. and while you would assume that that means that they invaded in their carp-like state, they may not have, for Sabimaru calls them spirits, and this scroll of an old battle calls them ghosts. Ghosts once lurked the lands of Ashina. The ghost's lightning was of the fountainhead gods, unstoppable by normal means. Whatever the case, the ancient Ashina were besieged by their lightning. And so, in addition to Sabimaru, which was an offensive tool, they actually developed in, a few defensive welcome, welcome. measures as well. First was the art of lightning reversal, and there's a guide to how to perform it hung in their dojo, where their warriors train. And second was something called eel livers. Eels, Eels. are relatives of dragons, and they allowed the Ashina to suppress the lightning force of the gods, though admittedly this didn't work for very long. This drug Mark is littered throughout Ashina Castle, and they even offered it ceremoniously at a couple of shrines. It's this remnant of an ancient war against the Okami. It's no surprise then that given all of this, the Ashina did come to consider lightning powers as heretical, 
Genichiro names them as such uh, when he invokes the name of his master, Tomoe. I will seize any manner of heretical strength. Tomoe was also of the Okami. She descended via the floating passage, and she was this benevolent being who decided to live amongst the Ashina. Reflective of her clan, she likely taught Genichiro how to use that bow of his, and she also taught him the lightning arts that he would go on to practice fervently. She would eventually sacrifice everything for a boy named Takedu, a boy cursed with the dragon's heritage, but that story is one for another time. <laughs> we follow the notes that Takedu and Tomoe left us, and they, in turn, are following the knowledge that was left by Tomoe's relatives, the Okami clan, when they first ascended to the Divine Realm. This is knowledge that guides us towards the Fountainhead Fragrance, which requires us to attain the Lotus of the Palace, which grows where the Fountainhead waters pool deeply. On our way to the said monkey. Lotus, we travel through the Bodhisattva Valley, the place where the monkeys dwell. Monkey. And fruits hidden by monkeys in tree hollows can sometimes ferment and turn into sake with a bit of luck. Oh, it burns the throat, same as ever. <laughs> this really brings back memories. I trained in the techniques of the shinobi mm, in the valley monkey. where the monkeys dwelled. By yourself? No. There were two of us. We were rogue shinobi. There was no proper master for the likes of us. That's why we went to the valley. To run, to jump, to clash swords. Where one slip would mean your doom. That was how we trained. We came to move exactly as monkeys did after a time. I'd drink this monkey booze whenever I tired of training. And I'd listen to the howl of my partner's whistling finger while oh. I drank. The whistle. Whistling through that ring would fill the valley with a somber melody. Strangely I enough, I enjoyed that sound. The sculptor's partner was called Kingfisher, a name that was etched onto her ring. Her cry could once be heard all along the waterfront of the sunken valley, and her whistle could be used to drive beasts wild. Speaking of which, this is the guardian ape. Sitting in the cove with the fountainhead water's pool, it's cultivating this lotus to give to its mate. For the ape actually lost his previous partner, whose corpse you find hidden away in an alcove. <laughs> it's been so long since he lost her, though, that even the flowers offered in tribute to her passing have withered to dust. For the ape is immortal. This is thanks to the centipede, which emerges when you sever the ape's head using this gigantic sword that likely once belonged to the sculptor's training partner, the Kingfisher. It's an incredible weapon, but it's no mortal blade, and within the immortal ape's belly, we find the Kingfisher's ring. What's that you have there? Where did you get that finger? The guardian ape of the sunken valley. I found it in his belly. I see. To think it was in the belly of an ape. I'm sure it'll play a somber but enjoyable tune. A somber, oh, Make there sure it is. Make sure you use it well. If she is indeed dead, then the loss of this woman <gasps> could have been what first led the sculptor to become Shura. For when the sculptor turns again at the end of the game, you can use you can the Kingfisher's use... ring to play a somber tune, a weeping voice full of solitude and. Oh my God! So. Hang on, I'm having a big brain comparison right now. Yes, it's about Bloodborne. Who's surprised? So you can use the ring, uh, the whistle, against the demon, which stuns him. And it's in the same vein of how you can use the music box of a fucking Gascoigne's daughter to stun him. It's that same connection of using an item from a, a boss's past to stun them. That is so crazy. I and love beauty, it. Somber enough to temporarily quell a voice of rage. Oh, that's mean. It is mean. It's mean. With the Kingfisher avenged, we can claim the Lotus of the Palace, putting us one step closer to the Fountainhead Fragrance. Oh. Next, we travel to Ashina Depths, to this bottomless hole, to the Hidden Forest, 
and to Mibu Village. Remember to hit the notification bell so you don't miss when the video goes live. And I'll oh, see you next time. I love that. <laughs> the thank you alert. That's cute. <laughs> oh, how dare FromSoft hit me with that kind of feel stuff twice. You hate to see it. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, let's watch like w one more video for the night. Uh, which one do I want to see? Fountainhead or Senpu in the Dragon's Realm? Maybe that one. Long ago, an everlasting being called the Sakura Dragon took root in Ashina's lands. From it flowed various forms of immortality, powers that would go on to corrupt the lives of men. One of these was the Dragon's Heritage, a direct line to the Dragon's undying blood. And from that blood came the rejuvenating yes, waters. Yes, I beat which the was a Garden Ape twice. That grants beat them twice. This video's a bit too long. I want to watch a shorter one for our last video. Let's do this one. Here Shinobi, we go. have you ever heard someone playing the shamisen around here? I followed the sound and it led me to this well. It's faint, carried by the wind. It's coming from this hole. You hear it, do you not? I hear nothing. I mm -hmm. see. Yep. Perhaps I alone can hear it. Oh, nothing else matters. Everything is so sad. Melody. Someone get Truly me some smeating tissues. <laughs> this sound winds upwards from an ancient, decrepit village. It's a village hidden by the mists. Mists that coil in a forest. A forest deep below the earth. Only the devoted, or the exiled, can find it now. Will you be cast out, or throw yourself in? What? If you wish what? to go <laughs> to the very depths of Ashina, then you'd best cast yourself out. It's hard to know what the lives of the ancient Ashina were like, save that they lived on land that was coveted by many. The gate before this jump is a Tori gate, which marks the transition from the mundane to the sacred, and the land below is indeed sacred. So sacred, in fact, that the water, rocks, and soil here in Mibu village once attracted the attention of the gods. One of the gods worshipped here was likely the serpent Snake. god, as its skin is found throughout the village, and another was likely Buddha, a deity friendly with the serpent god, whose statue can be found desecrated in the main temple. Then, far away to the west, some event caused the Sakura Dragon to be cut free from its homeland. It drifted to the east, to Japan, where it found the fertile depths of Ashina. Then it settled here, conjuring a divine realm, usurping the lesser gods and tearing the fate of Mibu village in half. It seems like a lucky few would have immediately become citizens of the palace. Yeah, These a lot nobles. of Buddhist Megan. But that also means that most Mibu had to simply content themselves with the divine waters that began flowing through their village. These waters bestowed a ton of bounties upon the Mibu, bounties that were distributed throughout all of Ashina. Dragon Spring Sake, a drink that no words can do justice. Mibu balloons, orbs of water that were sealed with bountiful prayers, and even magnificent medicines good enough to be stored in this chest. <laughs> Apparently, created by Dogen, the famous doctor. And yet, for all the perks that were offered by its proximity, the Divine Realm still lay tragically out of reach, until the Okami clan arrived in Mibu village. Hi. This group of warrior women, technically called the Kura Okami clan, were among the first to figure out how to ascend. They did this by accruing three ingredients that they knew were stemming from the fountainhead and they created incense with them. Their first ingredient was the stem of a sakura tree. For even to this day, a sakura blooms in Mibu village. It might even be an ever blossom. And the Mibu have prayed with the power of sakura for the longest time. The second ingredient was the fragrance of a flower that thrives in the deepest waters of the fountainhead. They called it a lotus of the palace. And lastly, they offered a shelter stone, which is something that grows inside the body of one who has long drank from the fountainhead waters. 
It's a lot like these cancer-like grave wax lumps that manifest in all of the undead in the game. Huh. And these shelter stone rocks too can appear in the bodies of those who drink from these immortal waters. And wrapped in the fountainhead fragrance, the Okami ascended to the palace. Here, like the palace nobles before them, they too could drink of the purest waters, beginning this transformation into lithe, carp-like beings. And as this journey to the fountainhead entered the realm of possibility, a culture of Dragon Spring pilgrimage began to emerge. What year is it? What year? What year? <laughs> and hot cold. Tell me someone, it's like a cement puzzle stuck in someone's stomach? I guess so. That's probably a good way of looking at it. <laughs> Just. Question. Yeah. Tell me. It's the year of the Dragon Spring pilgrimage. Every few years, those seeking to join the wedding Ooh. procession would journey to Mibu, drawn to the village by black pine trees, which were set aflame with a fire that never went out. If you could pass a test, then you were able to join a procession that led all the way to the wedding chamber, a place that we know gives you the chance at admission to the Divine Palace. And the founder of Mibu Village states that the goal of this procession was to meet the Divine Dragon. Yeah. And for this, participants were required to master the secret Mibu breathing technique, which allows one to breathe underwater. Without this, the dragon cannot be met. And my best guess is that breathing underwater somehow facilitates a transformation into becoming a noble of the palace. You're basically becoming a fish, after all. True. And perhaps this is why we find so many upturned legs underneath Mibu Lake. Failed practice at breathing underwater. Mayhaps. How's the lore dive going? We have gotten sad many times. So going pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Perhaps. Game or sad. Perhaps they burrowed underground looking for slugs. Hear me out, because all over the village we find a sort of slug harvest. They're on boards, they're piled up on the ground where the Mibu are digging, they're everywhere. And they might even be valuable. If they're the same type as those found in the precious bait tooltip, uh, oh. because this is food that was given to the master carp that was found at Fountainhead Palace. This <laughs> would be a good example of an item that the Mibu could have brought to the palace for trade because there was trade between the Divine Realm and the Ashina. Our proof is in the dragon's tally board, a sort of idol that was given to merchants who were recognized as of dragon rank by the Imperial Palace. All was going well, but then war. Mm -hmm. The Okami suddenly, and without cause it seems, descended upon Ashina. They did battle with its people, and they put an end to any goodwill that did exist between the two lands. All records of this war call it long forgotten, so we have no idea what triggered this animosity. Damn, Perhaps that's crazy. I want to know why it's so bad. began to age and began craving the vitality of the Ashina. Maybe the dragon began to get sick. Or I wonder if the Okami simply became ambitious. Whatever it was, we know that it was almost certainly initiated by the Fountainhead because it came at little cost to them. Because even though their assault was eventually repelled by the poison of Sabimaru, it's unlikely that the Okami ever descended in their physical forms. The hanging scroll of an old battle hung in Ashina Dojo speaks of lightning Mom, wielding ghosts. This is making me want to cry. The lands Please the hold me. And this <laughs> is a description you. that can fit the Okami. These women wield lightning, which is a power of the divine dragon, and there are three known instances of the Okami projecting apparitions down upon the physical realm. The first is that of Orin of the water. If you're wondering why we count her as of the Okami, well, it's because her ghostly form is actually weak to the poison of Sabimaru, which is effective oh. against the Okami. This is important information to know because you're not getting past this Shamisen player without a fight. Why are you crying? <laughs> because I'm sad. What are you sad about? I don't know where Lord Sakuza is or what he's doing. It breaks my heart. If I can't see him, I'd at least like to know, but 
No matter how many letters I send, he never writes me back. And no one will tell me where he is. Actually, sir, can you tell me? Where is Lord Sakuza? I don't know. Oh, you're a liar too. Why must everyone hide him from me? You're probably sitting there waiting for me to explain Orin's lore. But honestly, it's tough. <laughs> uh, there are no other references to Lord Sakuza in the game, uh, save for one. This item description of Jinza's Jizo statue, which Jinzaemon gives to you at the end of his journey. I must give you my thanks, Shinobi. Your thanks? You brought the Shamisen player to me just a moment ago. She caressed me <laughs> while playing her sweet melody. It turns out she was calling to me this whole time. Shinobi, please take this. I'm so very tired now. This statue <laughs> was once given to Lord Sakuza, and assumedly this was by Orin of the Water. Somehow, it ended up in Jinzaemon's hands, and my best guess is that Lord Sakuza gave this statue to Jinzaemon's father, because Jinzaemon's father does know about Mibu Village. He probably eventually passed this down to Jinzaemon with a warning. Hmm. Never visit the ominous town hidden in the mists. The second apparition of the Okami is the corrupted monk, of course, whose nebulous form guards monk. the Mibu Village cave entrance. After the war, it's unlikely that any more marriage processions were being accepted at the palace, and this animosity becomes the simplest explanation for her threatening presence here. The third set of apparitions are the bandits, conjured by the Mist Noble in the Hidden Forest. This boss has usurped <laughs> one of Buddha's temples, adorning it with a more homely feel, and he strings the poor monks up by their ankles. Hey, hey you! Will you slay he who opposes Buddha? The one of whom I speak hides in an abandoned temple up ahead. He sealed away the village in a shadowy fog so that he can fool the villagers. I've gotten terribly old, but this old man would like to see Lord Buddha return to his temple once more. The most curious reveal of this dialogue is that the Mist Noble seeks to seal the village away to fool the villagers. I'm pretty sure I know what fooling the villagers means, because by sealing away the village, you're essentially maintaining this status quo in Mibu Village, preventing the Buddhist monks from returning to the village and keeping the village isolated from the world. Mm -hmm. But the manipulation of the villagers goes even further. Bask. Basket, 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 I am a basket. <laughs> this basket case is named Shosuke, one of the few who actually resisted the temptation of drinking the now stagnant water of the fountainhead. Ugh. What is wrong with this village? I'd sure like to know that too. Before I knew it, everyone had gone insane. For a while, I too was in a daze, but I snapped out of it after I uh, threw up. I was thirsty, so I drank a lot of sake. I'm sure that's what made me throw up. The head priest sometimes treats us to sake, but you know, when you drink sake, you get thirsty. The sake cask runs dry in no time, so everyone has no choice but to drink the water in the ponds and rivers. But the more you drink it, the thirstier you get. Oh. You get thirstier and thirstier, can't ever drink enough. The water here was obviously once very pure, but now it's stagnant and something's wrong with it. It is, of course, uh, very similar to the rejuvenating waters of Ashina, as the villagers who drink this become undying. Because when you kill one villager, the very same villager resurrects a few moments later, mm -hmm. confirming that the villagers are in fact undying and on top of that, they now have this undying fear of fire, which is also in line with Ashina's rejuvenating water. 
an unquenchable fire. Even now, the thought of it gives me chills. The hunter, Inohiko, started burning pine resin and locked himself in his house. His pine resin burns a long time. It's a real nuisance. The villagers previously destroyed these black pines that were guiding people to the village. But now it seems like a man named Inuhiko defended those pines and hoarded their ever-burning resin. For this, the water-drinking villagers came to loathe him, and they hide in the earth outside his home, just waiting for him to come out. Inuhiko is the village outcast. He likes eating wild animal meat in the sort. That's why the head priest doesn't give him any sake. The head priest is holed up inside the main temple, and he's hoarding what is almost certainly sake from the Dragon Spring. Yes, I can feel it. Dissolving. Liquefying. Oh, the cup has run dry. Oh yeah, this guy, I remember him. But this won't do. It's too dilute. Refuses to dissolve completely. Unfit to be citizens of the palace. Oh. In the Fountainhead Palace, you can find this pure water of the palace, which was a drink that once visitors to the palace Instead of a war were rem, I guess rem, rem, rem. It transforms rem, the priest into a noble, confirming three things. First, that humans can become nobles. Mm -hmm. Second, that those with red robes are high-ranking head priests. And third, the fact that he drops carp scales confirms that the nobles of the palace are, in fact, carp-like in form, explaining Mibu's affinity for slugs, and also explaining the worship of the great carp up above. As I tie this episode up, some of you might be saying, Hey Vardy, why don't you talk about the giant rope creature <laughs> at the end of Mibu Village? But technically it also appears in the Fountainhead as well, so until then, afraid not. <laughs> if you I can forgive that. that pun, then consider checking out the new merch below the new video. Merch. This is the fate of kings, the skull of a monarch offered up in a dark ritual. The gold Love your merch, bud. I do. It's, it's good. It's good stuff. All right, one this last video. giant rope creature perplexed us all last one. as he sort of Welcome dabbed in, us onto uh, the cliff before the Fountainhead Palace. While it's mentioned in no item descriptions, we can actually make an educated guess about what he represents. Yes! So, let's tie a knot in it. Once and for I'm so sorry about the pun. <laughs> a shimanawa, or enclosing rope, is a length of hemp or rice straw that's commonly found woven around Tori gates, Shinto shrines, and also sacred landmarks. They're here to act as a sort of ward against evil spirits, or to indicate passage into a pure sacred space. Quite a few of these exist in game. For example, there's the gate right before the valley that houses the sacred serpent god. Oh yeah. And since the divine dragon looks about 20 times as divine as the serpent god, I guess they needed a bigger rope for the divine realm. Blocking our way to said realm, however, is the real corrupted monk. Gee. A warrior woman who guards the Vermilion Bridge. So, one thing that marks female warriors as of the Okami clan is a vulnerability to Sabimaru's poison. She doesn't have that vulnerability, but what she does have is the signature laugh and movement of the Okami, which marks her as a part of their clan, but perhaps she's not a part of their bloodline. Anyway, she has some really fascinating additions to her character compared to the rest of the Okami. First and foremost, she's infested, hence she's immortal, and this happened to be a quality that the Fountainhead thought would be quite appropriate for an eternal watcher of their palace. Her true name is Priestess Yao, and this is a name that user Sarumaro on Reddit thinks is a reference to Yao Bikuni, a fisherman's daughter who became immortal after eating the flesh of a Ningyo. And I completely agree with this theory. So, Ooh, a Ningyo is best translated to mermaid, for those of us in the West. Though, more accurately, it's described as a fish creature with shining scales, a humanoid face, and the mouth of a monkey. 
Mouth in the story of, of Yao Bikuni, she eats the flesh of the Ningyo, and those who do so are said to be blessed with incredible longevity. And this is what happened to Yao Bikuni, mm. who, Monkey. in the story, went on to become a wandering immortal priestess. So there's clearly a parallel here to Priestess Yao, the corrupted monk, which leads me to believe that Priestess Yao may have eaten immortal Ningyo flesh as well. Because the Divine Dragon, in fact, is called the Ningyo Dragon in the game's Hidden Files. And related to the Divine Dragon, through a Chinese legend, are the Great Carp. The Great Carp are also a type of Ningyo. They're a fish with human origins, because the Pot Nobles all aspire to become a Great Carp. Mm -hmm. If you ever happen across another part like mine, ignore any requests he makes of you. He's the shame of our clan. Oh. He's a treasonous villain who attempted to kill the Great Carp for his own benefit. Thus, there have been many Great Carp over the years, and you can find their corpses littering the Fountainhead lake bed. Mm -hmm. All of these rotting corpses are a sort of testament to the ambition, the backstabbing, and the desperation of the Pot Nobles to become eternal. Soon, I will be a Carp, and as age withers you away, as you sit powerless in the face of eternity, I am a be the new great Curiously, one such corpse is infested with luminescent centipede creatures, which may well explain the infestation of Priestess Yao if she did indeed eat the Nino's flesh oh, like her yeah. namesake. Oh, yeah, that did. all circles around. So, oh, that's so cool. This is a really strong theory to think it could be this Japanese legend about eating the flesh of the Nino, which. It's the missing puzzle piece to us understanding where the infestation comes from. And at the very least, it is the fountainhead rejuvenating waters that spread the infestation throughout all of Ashina, as mm -hmm. many of the infested have clearly drank deeply of these waters. Near the infested corpse of the Great Carp is the fallen spirit of Yashariku, who haunts the bottom of the lake. So the Headless are ruined forms of Ashina's heroes, and Yashariku in particular has a really interesting story. So he died to the palace nobles, but his spirit fall states that he might not have had his twin been at his side. Alas, his twin was lost in childbirth, which goes on to explain why we lose half our health when using his item and why a second apparition fights beside him below the lake. He was never quite whole, even after death. Mm. Much of the architecture below the lake has become uninhabitable thanks to the overflow of divine water, and there's no one here capable of rebuilding this because their civilization is now literally comprised of a warrior caste in the Okami and a noble caste with mm -hmm. the palace nobles. And even more, of their area is in the process of being destroyed by the Great Carp. So placating the carp has become a necessity. This explains our slug harvest discussion in the last episode, and all of those slugs likely end up here in the hands of the Great Carp Got attendant. it, so it is My the bait. My father is now a noble, and the moment he became one, he found himself entranced by a carp, the Great Carp. For a long, long time since, he's done nothing but feed that cursed carp. Young man, please release my father from the carp's bewitching powers. I know my father wouldn't wish for an eternity like that. So their father became a noble in the lifetime of these two daughters. So it follows. Welcome in, uh, Ayo. Yeah, we're watching uh, the lore video, uh, diving into the game Sekiro, which I beat last week. Uh, so now I'm just kind of watching these videos that explain a lot of the um, backgrounds of the characters and uh, goes more in depth about each location's story and history. So yeah, we're just kind of absorbing like more Who's about the that? game. These it's women might have been some of the last to come through here from Mebu Village. They're the only remaining humans we find in this place, and they're so old now that they've basically become all but invisible to the palace nobles, because 
they no longer have any youth to drain. Mm -hmm. Young man, please be careful. The palace nobles have a craving for the vitality of youth. They can't help themselves. They want nothing but to sap away more and more of it. For generations, wedding processions were led from Mibu village, leading to the Divine Realm, which was an honor that was bestowed only upon those who could master the Mibu technique of breathing underwater. And when they arrived, the wedding procession was allegedly given water of the palace, which can then turn you into a noble, and then you would be fit to become a citizen of the palace. Or were you? Because behind locked doors, in a dark room that leads up to the Fountainhead Peak, there are these red nobles of the palace, whose outfits oh, right. likely denote their higher rank. This and area. here, they feast upon the corpses of the Okami. And they do so while right behind them lie a set of white wedding palanquins. Palanquins that surely belonged to the wedding processions derived from Meibu village. And if they oh. had no problem devouring their own kind, then they certainly wouldn't have a problem draining the life force of those coming from Meibu village. And if they had no problem killing them, then the very least of their concerns would be the great carp attendant, who they tricked into performing a really undignified task. True. You, you beast. You tricked him all this time! Nobility this, and eternity that! Pretty lies to fool him! Give him back! Father! My father! Give him back! <laughs> so, as Fountainhead culture descended down a really dark path, it's no surprise that Tomoe and Takeru saw fit to leave. So these two are basically mirror images of Sekiro and Kuro. Mm -hmm. They're a divine child and their guardian, just like us. Except that Tomoe and Takeru descended from the Fountainhead and then began to mingle with the Ashina elites. Back then, Lord Genichiro and I would come here a lot. Lord Takeru would play the flute and Lady Tomoe would dance under the ever blossom. It was a wonderful sight. Note that oh. just as Takeru played the flute of the palace nobles, so too did Tomoe dance like the Okami of the Fountainhead. It's a cool little detail. That so day neat. beneath the branches of the ever blossom tree, Lady Tomoe tried to commit suicide. Why? She said, those made immortal by the oath of the dragon's heritage shackle their masters. So in order for the purification to occur, the oath-bound of the dragon's heritage must die? Yes, precisely. Speaking of the oath-bound, one trait of those touched by the divine dragon appears to be this streak of white atop one scalp. Mm -hmm. Sekiro has it, Kudo has it, Kudo 2.0 has it, hell, <laughs> even the Okami warrior women have it but none have it more than the purple-garbed lightning-bearer atop the great Sakura tree. You. Her hair is pure white, perhaps a testament you to Kuro the shit. age of these eternal beings that were blessed by the Divine Dragon. And it bears mentioning that the actual name of the Divine Dragon in Japanese is the Sakura Dragon, Sakura which dragon. is a name that suits it way better when you consider the nature of the Sakura tree. These cherry blossoms, if you didn't know, they only bloom for one week in an entire year. It's this period of exquisite beauty that sadly cannot last, but is all the more beautiful for it. To the Japanese, this symbolizes an acceptance of destiny, karma, and mortality. And this balance is really usurped and turned kind of unnatural in Sekiro because mm -hmm. the Sakura here bloom permanently. And this is, of course, thanks to the Sakura dragon who drifted here from the west. And he probably was lost until he discovered Japan, which luckily also had Sakura trees. And he decided to settle in this fertile land, which forced the lesser gods out. And I've spoken of these lesser yeah. gods before, since it's possible that the lesser gods are the serpent god and Buddha, who 
were once a part of this region. But I should really also be mentioning the white dragons of the tree. These wizened little dudes My that boys. also fit the description. Their faces can be found on the architecture of the oh, palace. I Thus, that. I think it's likely that they were actually here before the dragon took root. They are of the tree, after all, and I True. reckon these little gods were merged with the divinity of the Sakura dragon when he made their tree his own. And we mentioned the white hair of the Oathbound as well, something that is also seen with the old dragons. They have become this really sickly white. Literally, too, because they are very sick. Mm -hmm. In contrast to the black dragons, these white dragons are a representation of dragon rot and the stagnation that's afflicting us all. And it's actually the act of killing these white dragons that purges the affliction from the tree, which causes it to blossom, which causes the Sakura dragon to rouse itself back to life. And the first thing we notice with the dragon is that it's terribly wounded. And mm -hmm. there are some interesting theories on this as well. So first, it could be wounded because it's showing the effects of dragon rot. Or maybe it had these wounds before when it was cut free from the West and drifted to Japan. Or an even better theory, it's possible that these wounds the dragon has mirror the wounds that we, Sekiro, and Kudo also have sustained. <gasps> oh, I we love that. are of the dragon's blood, after all, and just like the dragon has lost its left arm, we have as well. And just like the dragon has a gash on its chest, Kudo also cut himself with the mortal blade when he drew blood for the Fountainhead fragrance. Another really likely theory is that maybe it sustained these wounds during an earlier fight, and the best candidate for a fight against the Divine Dragon is Tomoe, who would have fought the dragon for its dragon's tears. And Tomoe may have also been the original owner of the second mortal blade, the Black Blade. It's easy to complete Sekiro without really realizing that the Black Blade exists, but yeah. it is a supremely important item for explaining the story. Its real name is Open Gate, a weapon with the power to open a gate to the underworld, which, if you didn't know, is what happens at the end of the game when Genichiro summons his grandfather back in his prime to defeat you. God, and its still. description has one final line, one that reads, I beseech you, make offerings for the dragon's blood. This links the weapon to the divine dragon, and while it's the most sinister example of the divine dragon wanting an offering, it's not the only example of offerings. The Okami dance as an offering, mm -hmm. the Mibu were brought here as marital offerings, those of the Fountainhead had a practice of cutting spirit emblems from their flesh with a ceremonial knife. There's also a shrine maiden here who has passed away praying at the dragon's shrine. And then there's the Black Blade, which was allegedly used for offerings as well. And now let me explain why the Black Blade would have belonged to Tomoe. First, we know that Tomoe wanted to sever immortality, and for this, she needed the tears of the Divine Dragon. However, while the Black Blade could wound the Divine Dragon, it couldn't impart its tears, and for this she would need the Red Mortal Blade, which is actually named the Gracious Gift of Tears. It's oh, designed for this that. purpose, but unfortunately for her, it was hidden away by the Senpo High Priest, and no matter what Tomoe tried, she could not get him to reveal its whereabouts. Skill issue. And she did try to get it, which puts her at odds with the Divine Dragon. Second, those Tomoe was closest to in Ashina ended up knowing a lot about the Black Blade. A scroll describing it is left outside of Ishin's quarters. Genichiro trained under Tomoe and Blessing later managed issue. to find the Black Blade. And Takeru wrote of beheading L with the plus Mortal ratio, Blade, plus you're not blessed. an act that Genichiro performs with the Black Blade at the end of the game. My point here is that Tomoe influenced the lives of so many people, and it's crazy to imagine that we might not learn more about her in the future. Yeah. This series took a long time to make, so if you enjoyed it, please consider checking out vatividia.com, <laughs> where you can find this ever-growing collection oh, of Vati. souls inspired- Non-stop bangers. That was great. I loved- I love learned learning about this, this game so much. 
I loved it. This is really good lore. It's just fantastic all the way around. I love it. I mean, yeah, I, I have binged all of his Bloodborne videos. Um, in their entirety, I have watched every Bloodborne video this man has produced <laughs> many times over. So I'm happy to finally watch some more about Sekiro. Um, now that I know a lot of the lore, I just, like, I even, I love this game more than I already do, which is already, like, a bunch. <laughs> I don't know Dark Souls lore yet. Uh, I will be doing a video or a stream much like this in the future. After I beat Dark Souls 2, uh, I'll be joined with my friend Shanala and Drakillion, who are both like Dark Souls experts. And we're going to go through Dark Souls lore together on stream. So that'll be a big event in the future. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And if you also enjoy lore dives like this, um, as a reminder, I do have on my channel a stream where I read out all of the Bloodborne lore uh, to chat. It's a, uh, a reading stream that I did a couple months ago. Uh, yes, I did beat Dark Souls 3. The VODs are also up on YouTube. You can catch those there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the problem is called stream here. I really just enjoy kind of watching videos. You know, I. I'm less in the mood to play the game. I just enjoyed the movie night aspect of stream today, so a little a little baby stream. But I'm I'm live like every day this week, so I think it's fine to do one little tiny stream as a treat. So, um, speaking of, I do want to remind you guys about our schedule for the week. So let's quickly go here and show you all the schedule. It's a big one. <laughs> so as a reminder. Tomorrow, I will not be on my stream. I'll be at Void Tappy's channel for our big Outer Wilds collab, where they are playing it for the very first time. I'll be their co-pilot uh, through Outer Wilds. And then Wednesday, I'll be back here for the DLC. Geogus on Thursday, Breath of the Wild Friday, Pizza Tower on Saturday, and Sunday is House Slipper. So, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you all for today's stream. I was a bit nervous about doing like a, a video watching event, but I'm happy that folks enjoyed it with me. I love uh, FromSoft's writing and world building a whole bunch. Um, yeah, so there's the Discord link in chat, my Twitter, AdvanceGG. I do want to give a quick shout out to Andu, my friend who drew the lovely server art for Discord. So please go follow Andu. There are a. Oh, it's on a cooldown. Ah. I'll wait a minute. But yeah, Andu did some really cute banner art for my channel, and they are a very, very talented artist trying to hit 10k on Twitch, so you know. Give them a follow if you can. There we go. I'm still... Fine, I'll do it this way. For now. So. Anyway, let me go find someone to raid. But yeah, uh, again, thank you guys so much for enjoying today's stream. Uh, I really love just lore diving with y'all. It was a great experience. So I think I know who to raid tonight. I uh, got a few ideas already. Uh, oh, psh, easy. I found my target. Simple, easy, easy, easy. Uh, we're gonna go raid uh, Skyheart. Sky's playing Celeste. I, I love Celeste so much, so let's go raid Sky. One of my one of my dear friends who's playing a really good video game, uh, and the raid message shall be, "Hey, welcome in, uh, Epian. Thank y'all. We'll do this. A him him Sekiro is sad. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow on leg stream for Outer Wilds, or back here Wednesday for Outer Wilds as well." But until then, thank you again for enjoying the lore with me. I really appreciate y'all hanging out tonight. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye!